Kudu village outside Malamulele in Limpopo has welcomed the conviction of five men for his murder. He was shot dead outside his home in July 2022. Five men were yesterday convicted for his murder and five other charges at the High Court in Pulukwane. Family representative Etikin Maluleke says the family is happy with the judgment but want police to continue with investigations to apprehend three other people who were also implicated during the trial. As a family, we welcome the judgment because there was a lot of collaboration when to look into the case itself to show that they, they, were, they, were, they, were, they planned this and they did this. But there was a so-called Mafanas, a driver. There is an ANC gentleman guy who up to so far is not brought to, to this case. I think if the police can investigate more to bring these uh, characters in, uh, into the book, is then when every, everybody will have a closure in this case. Student beneficiaries of the National Student Financial Aid Scheme, NASFIS, will soon embark on a national shutdown, halting operations at universities across the country over the delayed payments of allowances. The frustrated students say that NASFIS has not paid out allowances for the month of April, resulting in them not being able to buy food and pay their rent. They lay the blame on controversial companies that have been appointed as middlemen to to administer NASFIS on behalf of government. Student activist Kiamuketsu Masiki. So currently we're planning a national shutdown. We're still going to, we're going to declare a date. We're going to camp at the Pretoria Department of Higher Education in the minister's office. We're not going to leave there up until our issues are resolved. We're not going to leave there. This is not going to be a normal protest where we submit a memorandum of demands and then we await feedback. The Water and Sanitation Minister Senzum Kunu has confirmed that Hamanskral residents north of Pretoria will start receiving clean portable water by September. The minister and the city of Tswane Mayor Salir Spring inspected the ongoing upgrades at the Roy Val Waste Water Treatment Plant and the Club Drift Package Plant outside Hamanskral. Hamanskral communities have been experiencing poor water supply for many years. More than 40 people died after allegedly consuming contaminated water last year. Minister Mkunu says they are making progress to provide clean water. It's no longer an open-ended thing in September this year. But in the meantime, Tswane is going to be running tankers, maybe a pothole here and there, just to ensure that people get clean water. And finally, the Israel Defense Force has confirmed its aircraft has eliminated three sons of the political leader of Hamas, Ishmael Haney, describing them as Hamas military operatives. Haney says the deaths will not affect the militant group's demands in ongoing ceasefire negotiations. The news comes as Palestinians in Gaza are marking Eid, the end of Ramadan, amid the continuing conflict. The BBC's Sebastian Usher has the details. Hamas says the car that Ismail Haniyeh's sons were travelling in was hit in Ashati camp in Gaza. Mr Haniyeh heard the news as he was visiting wounded Gazans who'd been taken for treatment to the Qatari capital Doha, which is where the Hamas leader lives. His response was to thank God for the honour bestowed on him with what he called the martyrdom of his children and grandchildren. He also said that the killings would not change Hamas's position in the current ceasefire talks. Recapping the top story, e-tolls will be scrapped in Gauteng at midnight tonight. The e-tolls were introduced in Gauteng in December 2013 as part of the Gauteng Freeway Improvement Project. For SFM News, I am Anne Musa. A very good morning to you in your SFM Sports Headlines Swimming. Tatiana Smith makes waves with a near world record in the 200-metre breaststroke at the Olympic trials. And in rugby, the Springboks Trophy Blitz continuing, bringing the Webb Ellis Cup to the Southern Cape this week. Stay tuned for more details on these stories and others just before 6.30. SAFM, guiding you through the rush hour traffic. Uh, good morning. We saw this yesterday afternoon, and it looks like there's um, a carryover into this morning. It's the um, N1 South in Pretoria. There's an additional lane closure at that sinkhole just past the R21 that's been there forever. There's always been two lanes closed, but uh, from yesterday afternoon, it looked like a, a third lane had been closed, and we've got confirmation from motorists this morning uh, driving that section. The N1 South after Rigel Avenue is already backing up. Uh, that's going to be... A very heavy run through the 
Skiing One South. So make sure you're going nice and early this morning. Uh, lights are off on the Mopati Highway at Eski and Perth Valley, so there's some real queues there. And if you're coming out of Shoshang Guve, the Ruth First Highway or the Ruth First Road out towards the Mopati Highway is currently closed by the police. So that's forcing traffic to uh, divert down to the Hebron Road, and there's quite a bit of congestion in that part of town. Uh, the other uh, incident we're watching is uh, the driving to Cape Town on the N2. There's a breakdown near the airport runway, and that's already causing a delay deep back into Kyalicha. I'm Rob Byrne. SAFM Sunrise starts now. SAFM Sunrise. A vivid start to your day. Six minutes after six. Good morning. Welcome to SFM, SFM Sunrise. I am Stephen Krutus. I know I may not sound entirely like him this morning, uh, but I am Stephen Krutus. You'll have to excuse my voice a little bit. It'll warm up as we go through the morning. Well, I hope it'll warm up at any rate. I don't know if you've ever had one of those old cars where you have to sort of rev it for a while or start it for a while. I know some people who did strange things. You boil a kettle and put it on top of the bonnet. I mean, why would you do that? I mean, strange things that people do. Anyway, that's a bit how I feel about my voice this morning. I've got a box of tissues in front of me. Can you hear it? There we go. I've got uh, a little bit more coffee than usual, which is uh, well above the prescribed limit. Um, and uh, anyway, we'll see how we go through the morning. Uh, busy times, I must just say. Uh, I hope that uh, the sort of chill hasn't got to you uh, yet. <laughs> it may well uh, still be coming. And I think a lot of campaigning now uh, for the elections underway at the moment. President Sura Maposa, he was at the Jabalani Mall in Soweto yesterday. He was talking a little bit about Gauteng, SABC news.com pointing out how he was really talking about how important uh, Gauteng is. I think he used the phrase, it's the coveted jewel, jewel that everybody wants, which I thought was a very interesting sort of phrase, talking about you know how important it is in these elections. If you look at the polling, and, and I'm a bit sort of sceptical of some of the polling, but if you look at that, the numbers are telling us uh, there's going to be a big fight in Gauteng. Also, of course, KwaZulu-Natal. Uh, the SACP General Secretary, Salim Apaila, he was talking yesterday. And there was a big commemoration, of course, of the death, the assassination of Chris Harney uh, back in 1993. Um, so everyone talking about that. He said yesterday that all former Umkonto Isizwe soldiers should vote for the ANC as a tribute to Chris Harney. And of course, he's having a little bit of a go at the other political party, Umkonto Isizwe, when he says that, isn't he? And then Dimpo Harney, Chris Harney's widow, she was talking. She said, I thought this was quite a comment. She said, the assassination wasn't worth the pain and the struggle that people are living with now. Quite a big thing to say. Sort of essentially, I suppose, saying that, you know, this is not what people and not what Chris Harney died for. She says there's no political will to fix the problems or solve the challenges that we face. As I say, strong criticism. Fakilin Balu, the Secretary General of the ANC, saying in response, this is the truth and we know it. But we are trying to fix the problems was the way that he dealt with that yesterday. But strong criticism from Dimpo Hani, I think not the first time she's been critical of the ANC. Other events in the ANC yesterday, the ANC and Mpumalanga suspending their treasurer, Mandela Mcbi for three years. And part of that's sort of suspended. One year of that is suspended. So he's suspended, I think, uh, for two years. One person has been uh, expelled. Another person has been found not guilty. And the accusation is that these three men basically tried to sort of disrupt somehow the January 8th celebration of the ANC in Mpumalanga earlier this year. The idea, as I understand it, is that they demanded a meeting with the president in Pinar on the day. I'm not entirely sure why, but there was a sort of threat in some way that if there wasn't a meeting, well, then the event would be disrupted. So a lot of frustration around that, but the ANC and Mpumalanga acting on that, as we can see. We'll hear from them a little later in the show. Uh, final day for e-tolls. Um, I must say, I haven't very often been in a car that beeps as you go under the e-toll gantries in Gauteng. You know, that sort of little beep that you hear. Um and I know someone, someone at some point is going to ask me, do I have an e-tag? No. Um, did I pay my e-tolls? Now, that's a much more complicated question. Why would I? Why would you ask me such a thing? But do I have an e-tag? No. Um, and uh, Sindasiwa Chikunga, the Minister of Transport yesterday. Now, I find this, and if I may just say for a moment, you tell me if I get this wrong, but she seems to be saying that people who haven't paid, so people who have e-toll debts are still liable for the debt, but no one anywhere is talking about the refund. So, if I did pay for ETOLs, or if I didn't, um, would you then get the money back that you paid? But then you're saying no one's getting paid back for the money that they paid, but the people who have debt are still liable. It can't seem to work both ways, it seems to me. 
to, you know, maybe I, maybe I've misunderstood it or maybe there's a lawyer or maybe someone's going to use the phrase contingent liabilities or something. I don't know. honestly don't really care. This seems to be unfair uh, to me. Anyway, a very interesting uh, sort of thing. We'll speak to the CEO of Sanrel. Also, sort of quite high on the list of jobs I don't want. I I will ask. It's a bit of a relief now. There'll be some sort of certainty around it all, but we'll do that a little later. Um, A very interesting story, and Anne talking about it in her bulletin. The five men convicted, quite quickly in this case, of killing the mayor of the Collins Chabane mayor, Moses Malaleke. And she says the judge said that they wanted to rob him of 10 million rand, and they ended up killing him. I want to know how it is that they ended up, why they thought he would have 10 million rand to steal. I mean, were they, you know, would he have the money on him? Was there something to do with Nate? I mean, it's a very strange story. And I don't know if I quite understand everything that happened in this case, but the, the Muller Lake of family, you can just imagine. I don't know if the judgment brought closure. Maybe it didn't away, but I'm, I'm sure they're still feeling a lot of grief at the moment. The Judicial Service Commission, they've been meeting this week. And because only four people were nominated or accepted nomination to the Constitutional Court, they were in a quandary because under the Constitution to fill a vacancy, they have to send three more names than the vacancies. So if there's one vacancy, they have to send four people. If there are two vacancies, they have to send five. If there are three vacancies, they then have to send six, okay? Um, Because there were only four people nominated, they either had to put forward all four nominations or none. Um, And in the end, they put forward none. So all of that time and effort, you know, just sort of you know, fallen by the wayside. Very frustrating situation. And then another story this morning, Nelson Mandela Bay, that municipality, has lost 430 million rand from the national government because it hasn't spent its capital budget properly. So far, of its capital expenditure budget, it's only spent 37% of it. Now, you've got the money and you can't spend it. We actually had a mediated conversation about that. But if you live in Nelson Mandela Bay and you look around you at the state of your infrastructure, you might be quite frustrated. All right, a lot more to come, hopefully including my voice. You know how to get in touch with us this morning. 86 SMS 41391. Tweet SFM Radio and at Stephen Hurta. Send your WhatsApp voice notes to 0614-104-107. Good morning. It's 13 after 6. Two years since winning the EFC middleweight title in the most dramatic and controversial fashion, Luke Michael finally defends his belt for the very first time at EFC 112 against the imposing submission machine, J.P. Kruger. And in the co-main event, featherweight champion Iga Smiley Cabessa becomes the next athlete aiming for champ champ status as he battles the imposing Kaleka Block Cabanda. EFC 112 live this Thursday. Watch it on SABC Sport Channel on DTT Channel 4 from 7 p.m. Brought to you by SABC Sport. For years, Outsurance has been saying they'll save you money on your car insurance or you can ask for 500 Rand or 1,500 Rand cash if they don't. Here's Fundi, 46 from Brackenfell. I was not happy with what I was paying. I heard about the 500 Rand from Outsurance, but they give me lesser amount for my car. I'm paying 523 Rand on my 2013 and I-35. So here's how it works. SMS out to 30754. We'll give you a no-obligation car insurance quote. If the quote is less than your currently paying, you'll end up saving money on your car insurance every month. And if it's more than you're currently paying, you can ask for 500 Rand. And if you've been with the same insurer and claim free for three years or more, tell us you want 1,500 Rand. Give our children a call. It's a win-win. You can't lose. (laughs) SMS out to 30754 now. That's out to 30754. Our insurance is a licensed insurer and FSP. T's, C's and limits apply. Premiums are risk profile dependent and reviewed annually. Client comments do not constitute financial advice. The boys of Steve Parker resist to leave the pitch without a ticket to the semis. But there's a big problem. Kevin Hunt's boys say the last dance of happiness belongs to them. This is the Netbank Cup quarterfinal battle. Stellies versus Matatanza Pitori on Saturday 13 April at 2.30pm. Live on SABC1 and SABC radio stations. Also available on SABC Plus and SABCSport.com. Hashtag, we love it here. Proudly brought to you by SABC Sport. The Daily News Diary on SAFM. And Musa, good morning. Your voice sounds uh, warm and friendly this morning compared to mine. Well, good morning, Stephen. Some warm water with a bit of lemon might just help. I'm going to stick with the coffee for the moment. I have the lemon on standby. Okay, all good, all good. 
What's coming up today? Um, a reaction following the scrapping of the e-toll system and government saying that motorists with outstanding e-toll debt will still be required to settle it even after the system is scrapped at midnight tonight. The private prosecution of President Cyril Ramaphosa by former President Jacob Zuma is back at court and there's likely to be um, a, de- a date decided on and this matter was postponed in December last year. Zuma accusing his successor of being an assessor after the fact, after he allegedly um, failed to act against, uh, against prosecutor advocate Billy Downer and journalist Karen Morn, and that was for allegedly disclosing his medical details. And this is after courts have said that uh, Zuma can't continue with the private prosecution of Morn and Downer, right? True. Yes. It's a very strange story. Anyway. Police Minister um, Becky Kele and the National Commission of Fani Musamula, they will lead a community in Bizo in Marion Hill and it comes after police last week shot and killed nine suspects in the area who were wanted in connection with a series of violent crimes. And also there we saw community members speaking out about their fear to actually report crimes due to the threats from gangs. The 12 of the 15 suspects that was arrested during the Easter weekend in connection with the murders at the University University of Fort Hay. They are also expected to apply for bail in the Dimbaza Magistrates Court. And just lastly, as Muslims across the country um, celebrate Eid, that's marking the end of Ramadan, there'll be a lecture at the Gatesville Mosque that will be themed celebration and commemoration. And Musa, thank you very much indeed. Do appreciate it. We'll be listening on the radio 17 minutes now after six. Stephen Kruetes on SAFM. Let's have a look at your weather around the country this morning. Swane partly cloudy, 10 and 25. Johannesburg partly cloudy, 9 and 22. Frenaching partly cloudy, 8 and 23. Pombela cloudy with drizzle, evening fog, 17 and 20. Polokwane partly cloudy, 12 and 22. Mahakeng fine, partly cloudy in the afternoon, 8 and 23. Freiburg fine, 9 and 23. Mangung fine, partly cloudy in the afternoon, 8 and 20. Kimberley fine, 6 and 21. Uppington fine, 13 and 20. 26. Cape Town fine, a moderate southeasterly wind, 15 and 22. George cloudy, becoming partly cloudy, a light northerly wind, 11 and 17. Kopecha, partly cloudy, a moderate southwesterly wind, 10 and 21. East London cloudy, light morning rain, a moderate southwesterly, 13 and 20. Etiquini cloudy, isolated showers and rain, a fresh to strong southwesterly wind, 16 and 23. Richards Bay cloudy, isolated showers and rain, a fresh to strong southwesterly wind, 16 and 23. And Peter Maritzburg today, morning fog, otherwise cloudy, Isolated showers and rain, 12 and 20. And we will buy 500 cars and we will buy 500 more just to be the one who buys your car. We'll come to you and offer more. We buy cars, we buy cars. Cars, the easiest way to sell your car by far. Mummy Lodi Sandals ladies believe they belong at the top and they want the vital three points. But Linda Lani ladies are on a mission to shock Banyanaba style. This is the Hollywood Bet Super League. Witness the queens of the beautiful game. Mummy Lodi Sandals ladies FC versus Linda Lani ladies FC. The Sunday 14 April at 11 a.m. Live on SABC Sport on DTT Channel 4. Also available on SABC Plus and SABC Sport.com. Hashtag we love it here. Proudly brought to you by SABC Sport. For the love of the game. Worldview Update, bringing you closer to international or global news. In China, the country's leader Xi Jinping has held a face-to-face meeting with a former president of Taiwan. And what's the first meeting between a Chinese leader and a former Taiwanese president in Beijing? Since uh, 1949, Xi's meeting with Ma Yingzhu comes as the U.S. President Joe Biden is hosting a meeting of leaders from countries that uh, are around China. Ma has always campaigned for a closer relationship between Taiwan and China, but voters in Taiwan have recently shown their support for a party that opposes a closer relationship, while China has been accused of becoming more threatening towards Taiwan. Dr. Emmanuel Matambo is the research director at the Center for Africa-China Studies, at the University of Johannesburg. Dr. Matambo, good morning. Good morning, Stephen, and uh, good morning to your listeners. Thank you for the kind invitation. Sure. So there's a huge amount of symbolism here. Uh, The history goes back, of course, to the Chinese Civil War. How important is this meeting between Xi and Mao? 
Well, the meeting is quite uh, significant for its symbolism, as you said. In terms of its uh, political manifestation, obviously it comes at a very interesting time because um, in January, the Democratic uh, Progressive Party of Taiwan, which is uh, which has been more assertive uh, in Taiwan's uh, call for independence, won re-election, and uh, its its leader William Lai, who is uh, whose real name is uh, uh, Lai, uh, Lai Jungte will actually be taking over uh, the presidency of Taiwan next month, which is uh, which is in May. So in terms of its politics, this particular visit here comes at an, an interesting time because remember, this is uh, Mao, uh, Mao Yongzhou is actually a, uh, a former president of Taiwan, a member of the Kuomintang, which was China's ruling, uh, Taiwan's ruling party for a long time. But then it lost its election in 2016, partly because uh, 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 former President Mao's uh, close relationship with, with China. So in terms of its politics, it comes at a, uh, at a stage of uh, political flux, both between Taiwan and China. But in terms of its symbolism, obviously, uh, it, it is very important in terms of uh, Taiwan's moderation, so to say, because even William Lai himself has latterly tempered his view, so to say, in terms of Taiwan's call for independence. Um, there was a time when Ma was president and there was a time when Taiwan uh, seemed open to closer ties with China. Trade between them uh, uh, grew. I sometimes sort of forget that Foxconn, which is a huge company that operates in China, is owned by, uh, is actually Taiwan owned and makes products that are mainly sold in the United States. I mean, they're the company that really make most of the iPhones in the world. So there's a lot of sort of different relationships here. But Taiwan and China seem to be getting closer together. That seemed to have stopped, and voters in Taiwan are going in another direction. Why is that? Uh, first of all, it's it's important to reiterate the point that you made there, uh, Stephen. So. China and Taiwan still remain the, the biggest uh, trading partners, actually. To ch Taiwan's economy is vastly, vastly dependent on China's economy. Uh, in terms of air flights, for example, hundreds of flights fly between the two countries even today. So China is actually intrinsic to Taiwan's uh, economic uh, survival. But then what happened after 2016 when there was this pushback, so to say, from Taiwanese residents against China was because of that landmark uh, uh, conference that happened in 2015. So for a lot of people who might not know, this is not the first time that Ma is meeting President Xi Jinping of China. They met in Singapore in 2015 when President Mao talked about the, 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 the fact that there has to be a peaceful resolution between Taiwan and China. And because of that, Taiwan was moving away, so to say, from, from, from the Kuomintang, and that happened in 2016. So that is why this animosity that has come latterly between Taiwanese and China was because Mao was seen as more or less pushing Taiwan back into China. And Taiwan, as we know, has been since its uh, landmark election of 1996 has moved towards uh, an assertive liberal democratic state. So for many uh, ordinary Chinese who have been used to enjoying a liberal democracy, they look at China, so to say, as an authoritarian state under which they wouldn't want to subsume their democracy. So that just explains this backlash and Taiwanese move away from, uh, from China. The U.S. Um, sort of claims that China is becoming more assertive and the U.S. has a defense pact with Taiwan, which adds to the complexity here. Um, is is the, the sort of U.S. view that China has become more assertive uh, correct? Is that one of the reasons that voters in Taiwan are moving away from an idea of China? Just a side show there, Stephen, before I enter, I enter into the substance of your answer there. The United States this very week has been meeting with Japan, and they've just signed uh, deals about uh, military uh, cooperation in the South China Sea. This, to many people, is actually seen as a deterrent of China. So already we can tell where the United States uh, is in terms of uh, China and uh, China's claims over the, the South China Sea. Now, when it comes to Taiwan itself, I think President Xi Jinping, since assuming power in 2013, actually has been more confident, has been more assertive. His presidency is very different from the presidential style of Hu Jintao, his predecessor. Hu Jintao um, used to talk about the peaceful rise of, of China, so to say. But then I think President uh, Xi Jinping gained power at the 
time when China was already the second biggest economy, it has become more assertive, more open in terms of China's uh, capabilities, both in defense and technology. So that has given uh, his presidency a very assertive Mayan about it. But then we also have to understand the fact that when it comes to Taiwan, he has stated that the reunification with Taiwan is almost inevitable, and he has said that no force will actually deter that particular reunification. But obviously, the the, the argument that he calls for a military or de, 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 uh, violent takeover of Taiwan has been amplified by his detractors. Even in his talks with uh, former President Mao, Xi Jinping talked of China and Taiwan being the same family, the same country, and that does not include the militarist or violent rhetoric that his enemies tend to amplify. Dr. Emmanuel Matumbo, thank you very much indeed. Really appreciate the time. Research Director at the Centre for Africa-China Studies at the University of Johannesburg. Well, of course, been watching that part of the world uh, very closely over the last couple of years. You with SAFM. Time coming up now to 27 minutes after 6. This is SAFM Sport with Zai Khan. Azid, good morning. Good morning. Zai, gosh, listen to me. Um, Tatania Smith, yes, her, uh, top spot again. Yes, Diva, she's had a name change from Tatiana Schoenmarker to now Smith after being married, storming to the top of the world, producing the second best 200 meter breaststroke win of her career at the National Olympic Trials in Kabecha last night. She sailed across the Newton Pool in two minutes, 19. 0.01 seconds, just six hundredths of a second short of the world record blitz that she unleashed when she won gold at Tokyo Olympics 2020. Now, touching in second place was her Tux training partner, Kaylin Corbe, in 2 minutes, 23.71 seconds, which was also inside the qualifying standard for the Paris Games, which kicks off on the 27th of July. Smith and Corbett were the two swimmers at the national championships to achieve qualifying standards. Also, was another qualifying time was Peter Kutsier. He claimed the 200-meter backstroke title. In the meantime, there were mixed emotions for Amy Canny in the 200-meter freestyle after achieving a new personal best time but just missing out on the Olympic qualifying mark by 0.13 of a second. Now, others to pick up national titles yesterday, there were the likes of uh, Matt Sates in the 200-meter freestyle, Matthew Randall in the men's 200-meter breaststrokes, and Hannah Pierce, and that's in the women's 200-meter backstroke. Other news, the swimming leg of the triathlon at this, month, this summer Olympics could be cancelled if heavy rain Rains affect the water quality in the River Seine. Now, recent testing by the charity Surf Rider Foundation Europe revealed alarming external levels of E. coli in the water. Now, there has been contingency plans in place, including delaying the event until later in the Games. And some news from the Olympics. As uh, World Athletics have been, uh, well, they've agreed to award 50,000 US dollars of prize money to Olympic gold medalists. It's becoming a game changer, shaking the foundation of the IOC. Now, this decision by Sebastian Coe, president of World Athletics and a potential candidate for the IOC presidency in 2025, adds a new dimension to the Olympic spirit and athlete motivation. Here's Sebastian Coe. I'm really genuinely hoping their response is positive. You know, commendably, they make sure that as the Olympic movement grows, that the, the, the beneficiaries uh, of growth are the sports and ultimately the athletes. So I think this sits firmly uh, behind those principles and philosophies that they espouse as well. And finally, rugby, the Springboks World Cup Trophy Tour will continue this week. Manny Libak and Marco van Staden will take the Webb Ellis Cup to the Southern Cape. Libak, who completed his high school career at the Otaniqua in George, will be joined by van Staden at the Garden Route Mall on Sunday and the SA Cup clash between the SWD Eagles and the Boland Cavaliers at Otaniqua Park. This will be the second stop for the second phase of the box celebration as SA Rugby aims to take the trophy around the country before its return to the world rugby in 2025 that's a wrap of your sport on sunrise more top of the hour i'm zai khan i don't think we'll ever have to give that thing back you with safm leading the conversation we'll hear from salia brink the mayor of tswane in the next half hour day 15 of no load shedding 6 30.
Good morning. In the headlines, DA leader John Steenhuizen has accused smaller parties like the Patriotic Alliance of selling the votes of South Africans to the highest bidder. Steenhuizen was speaking in Easteras in Pretoria yesterday, where the party launched its Rescue South Africa roadshow. Government says motorists with outstanding e-toll debt will still be required to settle it even after the system is scrapped at midnight tonight. The decision came as a result of an agreement between Sandral, the Gauteng Provincial government and the national treasury. And Hamas political leader Ishmael Haniyeh says the jihadist group's negotiating position will not change following the killing of three of his sons by Israel. I'll have details on these and other stories at 7. SAFM Guiding you through the rush hour traffic. Well, if you need to get from Pretoria to the airport, it's just got a lot more complicated than it has been. There's uh, roadworks at this sinkhole on the N1 South. Been there forever. Uh, double lane closure, but it's flicked over to a three lane closure. We saw it yesterday uh, with some very heavy traffic, even under uh, PMP conditions, coming down from Linwood Road. And we're looking at a very heavy Thursday morning as you line up on the N1, almost back as far as Gasfontein Road. And keep in mind, there's a lot more traffic coming as we go over the next a couple of hours. So N1 South, make sure you've got plenty of time to get through that backlog wherever you're going. Uh, if you're going to Joburg, but particularly if you're going down towards the airport, uh, that is going to seriously delay you. And then, of course, as you come off the N1 onto the R21, uh, you've got roadworks both approaching Clayville and uh, just after the Bopsontane exit. And that's a Clayville section of roadworks already starting to backlog as well. No traffic lights on the Mopoli Highway desk in Pathfelli, so that's heavy as you line up on the R80 back as far as Bremer Street. Uh, Ruth First Road coming out of Shoshone Gouve, top of the Pretoria Close at the Montpellier Highway. So motors are having sort of loop around and end up on Hebron Road. And that's quite a heavy backlog as your alternative route out towards the R80 option. Uh, Durban this morning looking generally OK. The N2 uh, running up through Spaghetti Junction towards some Getter Road, just starting to slow down. But uh, looks like a lighter uh, morning. We'll keep a, a track on that. And if you're driving into Cape Town, there's uh, this um, broken down vehicle just by the airport exit. And that's causing a delay coming in on the N2 from as far back as almost Spine Road in Kailicha. I just want to uh, mention this, which I omitted from uh, Joe but quite a nasty crash on the N12 at Benoni. A vehicle is overturned. It looks nasty. Uh, the traffic coming in from Davyton is uh, backed up quite heavily from Pitfontaine through Snake Road and down towards the uh, crash in of that Tom Jones exit. Rob Byrne, SAFM Traffic. The business update on SAFM. Well, I have a little bit of an announcement uh, for you this morning. As you know, Ray Machlaka left us a couple of weeks ago. Well, I'm pleased to announce this morning that Intel Leng Lechela has agreed to take over from Ray. And she joins us now. Intel Leng, good morning. Welcome to SAFM Sunrise. Morning, Stephen. Thanks so much for having me this morning. Well, I hope you stay with us for many, many years. All right. <laughs> uh, how are the markets looking this morning? Asian markets, U.S. markets? Stephen, it doesn't look like it's going to be a great day for financial markets. Let's actually start things off with the JSC. Local markets ended yesterday pretty mixed with the all share eking out those gains, ending the day up 0.04%. We then saw a bloodbath in international markets. U.S. indexes closing the day off in negative territory. Stephen, this was mainly due to that hotter than um, than expected rather U.S. inflation number. In March, consumer price Prices rose to 3.5% from February's print where prices were up 3.2%. Now, this further adds uh, pressure to the U.S. Fed, showing that the path to lower inflation remains extremely bumpy and that any loosening of monetary policy might not happen anytime soon. This has filtered through to those Asian markets. Those stocks started off the day um, in negative territory as they were caught up in the sour sentiment. Let's move over to those currency markets now. We saw the rand tumble from three-month highs. And just to put things into perspective, at one point on Tuesday, the rand was trading at 18.39 to the dollar. This morning, it's sitting above 18.70 to the dollar. This also on the back of the volatility we've been talking about, which has given the dollar an extra boost. And then, obviously, those minutes from the U.S. Fed, policymakers really worried about inflation, and that has an impact on when we will get lower interest rates. 
Definitely, the minutes are always one to watch as they provide clues on policymakers' current and future decisions. The recent minutes have um, reinforced the Fed's fight against sticky inflation, with a number of policymakers not really keen to cut rates before we see a consistent trend that shows that inflation is nearing the central bank's uh, 2% target. Now, if yesterday's print is anything to go by, then there's an expectation that those interest rates in the U.S. will stay higher for longer. Now, after the release of the minutes, we saw a number of economists move back their rate cut expectations, with some pegging cuts in the third quarter instead of the second quarter. We were initially supposed to see or were expecting a rate cut in June, but it seems like it might only come through in September. And this is not great news for South Africans, as the Saab also tracks uh, the Fed's move. Stephen, I was chatting to an R&B analyst, Michelle Warburg, who said that we'll probably only see rate cuts in South Africa once the Fed eases its policies. And with bids just being moved back in the U.S., she says that we might not even uh, get any mm. local rate cuts this year. Sure. So that much-needed relief for local consumers might not come as soon as we expected. And in Taoleng, very quickly, Fitch cutting China's outlook to negative. They're worried about China's growth. Listen, rating agencies are just coming down hard on China. Fitch, not the only ratings agency to lower the nation's credit outlook. Moody's did the same last December. Both agencies, as you've um, pointed out, have uh, pointed out those economic risks as China's been dealing with a property crisis. Surprisingly, Stephen, a number of analysts weren't really phased by this, saying that China's recent economic data points have been upbeat. If we look at retail sales, industrial production for the period between January and February, both prints have been showing growth of above 4% and vehicle sales also recovered last month. Now, this is just pointing to a strong start in 2024. And I'll definitely be keeping an eye out on how this has filtered through to growth with China releasing first quarter GDP numbers next week. Ntaleng Lachella, thank you very much indeed. She'll be back in an hour, 23 minutes to 7. Call us on 86 Africa Update on SAFM Sunrise, a continental overview of current African affairs. Mantula, good morning. Steve, refreshing morning and Jumbo Africa to the listeners. President Cyril Ramaphosa, he'll meet with the Botswana president, President Masisi, to pay tribute to the people who died in that horrible accident. Stephen, that is quite true. There, there are two uh, activities taking place today, both uh, both in our borders of uh, Botswana and South Africa in the province of Limpopo. Uh, that's where President Ramaphosa will be engaging with uh, President Mukwetsi Masis of Botswana, where they'll have a closed session briefing uh, around this morning, around 10. And around 1 o'clock, they'll be visiting the uh, bus uh, accident site, uh, where they will be looking at how uh, more than 45 people have lost their lives, Stephen, during the Easter holidays. So both presidents are going to be engaging on issues of infrastructure and the roads and uh, many other issues that I think President Ramaphosa and Masisi are also on an election campaign because it's an election year for both countries. And then in Sudan, more than 10 million children are now in an active war zone and they're living less than five kilometers away from gunfire and chilling. I mean, that's really so scary. Stephen, this is scary because this is coming from the Save the uh, Children uh, organization that has come up with the data that has said that uh, since uh, 2023, April 15, the war that has affected more than 10 million children. Also around the school uh, areas that children have not been going to school also, Stephen, it's beyond that they are affected by war, but they're not also getting education. And they're also having these challenges of losing their parents who have been going exile, who have been running away from this conflict. Hence the issue of mediation of the Sudan conflict. It is important for the sake of these children who have been suffering for almost a yeah, no. And then uh, Togo's government says a planned three-day protest over the arrest of opposition figures is illegal. Steven, the Minister of Interior uh, said that today there was supposed to be a protest by uh, opposition parties around the parliamentary elections, around the constitutional uh, amendment that has been done, but the election date has been pushed over a week now, Stephen. Yesterday, the cabinet of Togo coming up with the April 29 as the legislative and regional election date, but the 
opposition, they are still going on, Stephen, with the march and the protest today in the capital city of Lome. There might be confrontations, but we'll still report about what will happen tomorrow, Stephen, because Togo is on the news now. And then the situation in the DRC, the death of those Tanzanian soldiers through a mortar round, obviously raising questions around whether the SADC mission can defeat the M23. That is quite true, Stephen. Look at the numbers that we are having from both Malawi, Tanzania, South Africa, Stephen, and compared to the UN mission that was in the DRC. There are many security analysts who are raising this question of whether the SADC mission in the DRC will be able to defeat M23. And that's why we're having the challenge, Stephen, that we have lost the three Tanzanians, and early this year, there were two soldiers from South Africa who have lost their lives. So we are having a serious challenge with this mission. Um, And then in our archives, you're taking us all the way back to the 11th of April 2001. I remember this very clearly. Stephen, this is very sad because we know that uh, it was during the match of two uh, uh, big uh, teams in South Africa, Kaiser Chiefs and Orlando Paris at Ellis Park, where we had their stampede, where we lost almost 43 people who were killed. Stephen, very uh, shocking, as we know that uh, even in 1991 in Orkney, uh, there was the same uh, incident that happened. So this was the memories of uh, Okni 1991 that came back in 2001, almost 23 years ago in our archives this morning. Asante Sana LG is still leading the conversation. SAFM observing the Freedom Month. Harass Advocate Sipo Montula, thank you very much indeed. Of course, he'll be back in an hour. More news uh, from our continent through the day here on SAFM. Call us on 086-000-2032. Well, calls coming through this morning. Obviously, ETOL's a big issue this morning. Uh, the situation around the ANC and in Pumalanga suspensions there uh, that we've seen. Voice notes coming through as well uh, this morning on 0614-104-107. Good morning, Stephen and your team. This is Sakhilin Tsuwin from Mamlabyalangan. You know, Stephen, Figlin Balula will one day wake up an MK member because he's so obsessed with this newly formed political party. I heard him say that uh, Chris Han would have been disappointed with the leaders who form uh, new political parties. And that shows how obsessed he is with the MK party. Thank you. Oh, interesting. Yeah, look, I mean, I think I think in a way, if you look at the ANC and the, and the, and the MK statements, it might be fair to say they're kind of obsessed with each other, you know, uh, if you look at it. Vo- other voice notes coming through. Good morning, good morning, SG. It's Frederick Shaka here in Kezere. SG, as somebody who had complied during that time to get that E-Tech, now I've got this bill that says I owe it all 16,000 plus. What does that mean for me? Does that mean I am not going to be paying that? Does that mean it's going to be zero, zero? What is going on? It seems like they're just quiet or they're just waiting for the elections to end. Then they're going to tell us the real truth. (laughs) <laughs> yeah, look, I mean, we've been trying to get some information around how all of this is going to work. And obviously, everyone will have a slightly different case. But they're very strange things around it. As I said yesterday, it seemed to me that for the transport minister to say that people who owed debt were still liable under the law, but there's no provision for refunds. I mean, to put it another way, and I'll put this question to the central CEO later, if people didn't pay while the ETO policy was in place, what makes you think they'll pay when it's been scrapped? I mean, that doesn't make sense to me. I mean, on what planet is that actually going to happen? doesn't seem to make sense at all. You know the number this morning, 86 First in the morning, SAFM Sunrise with Stephen Hrutis. Well, the Minister of Water Affairs sends him Klunu telling residents in Hamanskral in Swane that they will get water, drinking water, out of their taps in September as work has now finally started on a plant that's supposed to provide water to residents there. There have been huge problems with the Royval Wastewater Treatment Plant. Last year, at least, I think it was 23 people died from a cholera outbreak there. As I understand it, there will be work done on the Royval water, Wastewater Treatment Plant at the same time, uh, there'll be another plant that will provide some water. Well, the mayor of Tswane from the Democratic Alliance is Celia Brink. Mr. Mayor, good morning. Good morning, Stephen. What exactly is being done now to sort out the water problems? So there are two aspects. The one is the 20-year, essentially 20-year infrastructure backlog on the Royval wastewater treatment plant, which is uh, biologically and hydraulically overloaded. It can't deal with the wastewater capacity, and so it's polluting the Arpies River, uh, the Lucral Dam, and then uh, is is rendering the water to a certain portion of Hamans Kral not suitable for for drinking and and for cooking. That project is uh, 
a three-year project. We have budgeted as a city as much as we can in any financial year, which is 150 million a year, to upgrade Royval. We have now appointed the DBSA as implementing agent on the project. They've got certain expertise in infrastructure. That does not mean that uh, they are above the irregularities that crept into uh, the upgrade of Royval previously, but we'll be keeping a very close watch. And there's a joint technical committee that includes National Treasury. Uh, and so there's far more oversight, I believe, on the upgrades this time. We will still need some money at the end of the project, which we haven't yet funded. But it is important that we start, because if we don't start, then the deterioration is just going to uh, continue uh, without limits. The second aspect of the project is this package plant to which you refer. That is the Department of Water and Sanitation, which uh, in their partnership with the city have said, until you fix Royval, what we'll do is we'll build this package plant. I think it's probably unprecedented in South Africa, the size of it, so that we can, uh, in a matter of months instead of years, give clean water in the taps uh, of, of the, the people of Hamans Kral that are affected by this. Uh, we did our inspection yesterday, and it seems that that project is also going well. But, uh, Stevens, there is risk there in the sense that the moment that package plant is operational, it cuts out the water tankers. And I said to the minister, we were to protect this project with everything we have because there's massive vested interests that wouldn't want to see that package plant operational. In other words, there have been sustained claims from previous water ministers too that there'll be sabotage to try and stop it from working. Well, it's, it's claims, but, you know, we've seen it in practice. We've seen the most bizarre things happen. Um, water infrastructure damaged, um, valves being closed, we also have seen a lot of abuse by the water tankering business. There's clearly a cartel. There's clearly, um, you know, collusion in terms of pricing and so forth. It is exceptionally expensive. And it's just caused so much distrust in communities mm. that it is better to be, uh, you know, cautious. You know, what's the saying? Just because you're paranoid doesn't mean they're not out to get you. <laughs> so. We know that the that the p package plant will eliminate the water tankering um, in phases, because it's the package plant is not going to be hey presto in one go. It's it's the, the first part of it is September this year. That's the plan. But as it comes online and as infrastructure is gradually upgraded, those water tankers will be eliminated. The other aspect thereof is the city's conducting a water meter audit for all of those households, and the deal will be that once your meter has been audited and a, a meter has been installed, a new meter has been installed, will also write off any historical debt in respect of water usage for that portion of Hamans Kral. Okay, so the packaging plant is the thing that's supposed to provide water by September. Uh, are you confident, all going well, that that's what will happen? Yes, I mean, some delays are probably inevitable and it's difficult to foresee each and every eventuality. You know, at, at at one point, you've got to do the paperwork right, you've got to do the processes right, and if you don't get that right, you incur irregular expenditure or you end up making decisions that have far bigger delays. So stuff such as tendering, stuff such as security, um, and you can ask the minister about this, that that, that is on his part of the, of the deal. But I, I think that as things are currently going, we are fairly confident, but the key for us is going to be to communicate on a regular basis to the affected communities. This is where we are. We're still on track or there has been a, a delay. But as things presently are, it looks like the first phase of that package plant will be online in September. Celia Brink, the mayor in the city of Tarnap, thank you very much indeed. In a moment, uh, your calls on 86 11 minutes to 7. SAFM, guiding you through the rush hour traffic. Just starting with an update from uh, Kruger Park uh, for Kruger Park travellers. We've seen this all week. The 536 route that links you from Hazy View uh, into Kruger Gate is uh, blocked again. It's quite an uh, impressive blockage this week. We've seen uh, sort of obstructions and then um, uh, yesterday we saw a tree across the road. This morning uh, it's complete piles of sand. It's near the Sabi River Bridge area. So the 536, if you want to get in and out of uh, Kruger Park, that one should be avoided and uh, choose some alternative gate access. Coming down the N1 in Pretoria 
area, super heavy delays this morning. We saw it yesterday, uh, seeing it again today. It's an additional lane that's being closed near the sinkhole just south of the R21 exit, uh, which has been there forever. They've always had the two lanes closed, but that additional lane closure uh, really causing some heavy backlogs. The M1 South is queuing all the way back uh, through to uh, Linwood Road. As you get out of that, uh, you pretty quickly into some more traffic on the R21 as you approach the roadworks at Clayville. So good idea to put a ton of extra time if you're coming out of Pretoria or through Pretoria uh, on the M1 and then R21 towards the airport. Uh, crash at Benoni causing delays this morning. In fact, there's traffic all over that uh, run through from Pitfontein right through to basically Boxburg towards the uh, Rondevold exit. Uh, Durban, the M2 going north, not uh, as heavy as it can be. There's a bit of queuing pressure through Spaghetti Junction, but a little bit lighter this morning. M7 towards the Bluff, that's queuing down to Bel Air Road as you get caught up in the uh, road construction that's going on there. And Cape Town Motor is coming out of Nyanga this morning uh, through to Philippi. There's some very heavy traffic on that uh, section of Govan and Becky. It's all backed up uh, through Dana Fontaine Road and down towards the sort of uh, M7 bridge area. And the N2, this is the run into uh, CBD, just backing up uh, as you approach Searle Street. This is Nelson Mandela Boulevard. Looks like something's happened around Searle Street. If you're going into town from Hospital Bend, you will hit that delay. Rob Byrne, SAFM Traffic. At SFM Radio and at Stephen Grutus on Twitter. All right, Harold on the line from Cape Town. Harold, hi, good morning. Uh, morning, Stephen. Go for it. Uh, yeah, I wanted to talk about your call yesterday on carbon capture and storage with the Council of Geosciences, which I think gave only advantages and are not any disadvantages. Now, just to say, firstly, of course, we have a climate crisis, and so we know that we should look at all options to cut our emissions, but I'm an academic having looked at this, and we look at advantages and disadvantages, and want to just highlight two key uh, disadvantages, uh, which is that CCS has not been proven at scale in applications to coal uh, that, that South Africa... Okay, five. so so Harold, hold on. I'm just going to stop you there for a second. I just want to go back a little sure. bit. Yesterday we had a, a conversation was was brought to us by the, the Council for Geoscience. Um, they were talking about carbon capture, which is, as I understand it, you when, when you have a big power station or something like that that puts out a lot of smoke, you capture the sort of particulates or the or the solids uh, so it doesn't go into the atmosphere and then you take that stuff and you bury it or you inject it into the into the rocks or something like that that's what we're talking about right Yes, correct. That's okay. what the explanation that Mr. Moana gave yesterday. Yeah. Okay. All right. So you're saying that that doesn't work cuz I asked Mr. Science Solid he said yes. Well, what I'm saying are two are, are, are many things, but two things. This is not proven at scale. So the, the, the most commercial application is enhanced oil recovery, but we really need it for coal. Um, and basically, just to give you a sense of the sort of scale, that's the one issue. The other is it makes electricity more expensive, which is a problem we didn't raise. So um, our total greenhouse gas emissions are around 440 megatons. That's a round number. The largest operational CCS uh, which you, uh, I think you mentioned is probably Orca in Iceland. That's four megatons a year, so one percent or less than one percent of the 440 that I mentioned, and that's geothermal. That's not for coal-fired power, and where there no there's no CCS applied to coal to liquids uh, that I'm aware of. So it's simply, you know, at best we could um, store one percent of our emissions per year, and and in my experience, I mean, following this for more than two decades. CCS in South Africa is always a decade or two away actually doing it, not mapping where it could be stored, but actually implementing projects at scale. And and the second point is CCS would make electricity more expensive, and I can go into that just uh, if you want to hear more about that. Okay, so you're saying that even if this, if what the Council for Geoscience said yesterday, if it does work, then there'll be other consequences to do with power pricing. I mean, how big would that increase be in your view? Well, um, basically, the, the increase is, uh, so, so let me just explain the, the basics. So the CCS technology uses energy in, in the process. So if we're adding that, as Mr. Kavana seemed to suggest, to coal plants, many uh, existing coal plants, that would result in less total electricity um, for the same cost. So it just makes even the coal plant uh, more expensive. And we you know we're all struggling with load shedding and high electricity prices. And so it makes... Uh, you know, both uh, it, it just makes that uh, worse, and they, that's in a context we have other options, many other electricity generating technologies that are less expensive than coal and can be built faster than adding CCS to those. So um, it just doesn't, ma- um, yeah. I mean, we do need to look at all options. Maybe CCS has some niche applications. I would say if you use it in South Africa at all. Perhaps some of the uh, uh, to Cecil. There's also a key difference, Stephen. So the 
the CO2 that comes out of a, a thermal power plant, a coal power plant, is about 10 to 15 percent of that is CO2. With fossil, half of its emissions, about mm. 70 megatons, is already concentrated. Um, and so if we used it at all, it would be there. But as I say, every time I, I read reports about those who are advocating for this particular technology, they say, well, actually doing this commercially is, uh, you know, a decade or two away, and, and the biggest thing that we've seen are about 1%, uh, as far as I can tell, 1% of our um, uh, national emissions. So I'm not say, uh, arguing against CCS. I'm saying it's one, it shouldn't be presented as a silver bullet or only having an advantage. Okay. We must look at the downsides as well. All right, Harold, on the line from Cape Town, thank you. I think we, we've heard you and that a reaction to that conversation uh, we had yesterday, which is still available, by the way, as a podcast, five minutes to seven. Agenda setting conversations of the day. Well, some questions it seems beginning to emerge about plans by the Basic Education Department to introduce a new general education certificate. As I understand it, it's supposed to make it easier for learners who don't get a matric to find a job. The certificate would be available to learners who finish grade nine. Professor Stephanie Alas is a professor of education and research chair of skills development at the Centre for Researching, Education and Labour at the Witt School of Education. Professor Alas, good morning. Thanks for your time. Professor, good morning. Are you with us? Yes. Hi. Can you hear me? Yes, I can. How How is this new certificate or this planned new certificate supposed to work? Uh, Stephen, you're asking the wrong person about that. You, you need to ask the Department of Basic Education. Um, I, I know about, uh, about as much about it as you do, which is that they keep saying that they're going to do it. There's very little public information available. And what they have not done in recent years, or also with their new proposals around a three streams model, is released any kind of clear document for public consultation, which actually set out the parameters. So all we know is the kinds of information that, um, that, that you actually said in your introduction um, it's been circulating as an idea for some time, and uh, I, th- I think the consultations are, are quite advanced in terms of actually doing it, but in terms of why and how, uh, that, that is not publicly available. So the idea, I presume, uh, this is my presumption now, would be that when a child, if a child leaves school and doesn't get him a trick, and, and I think this used to happen in the past in some places actually, you would get a sort of school leaving certificate or something like that. Um, is it important to have a qualification below that of a matric so that, um, you know, when people leave school, they go away at least with something? I know the risk to that is that some children may decide, well, I'm only going to stay until I get that certificate. I'm not going to stay until I get them a trick. Yeah, Stephen, I don't think that that is the risk, in fact. And you are right that that it did used to exist in the past. It exists in many African countries. It used to exist in many countries. The global trend is in the opposite direction. So we would really be fighting against the stream. Um, and I have not seen any evidence to, to show what, how this would help anyone. I don't think there's a risk that people would, would, would drop out. People do drop out of school for a whole range of reasons, but I don't think it's because they're, they're holding on for that matric certificate. And I don't, you know, I think that a certificate at grade nine level would be of so little value that um, no one would take it as an indication that they're good to go and that they can leave school. So, you know, I think the reasons that, that many of our young people drop out before they reach matric um, would, would not be affected one way or the other. I think there's other reasons why. I mean, I don't think we've seen any convincing evidence about how it would improve any single aspect of the system. If you are going to have a certificate, it has to be really credible. To have a really credible certificate, you have to have, firstly, a very, very credible assessment mechanism. But then, you know, what what is not clear in the proposals is, is the DBE saying that kids who don't pass that assessment can't proceed into grade 10? Or what, what, what are they saying? Um, to run a really credible, rigorous assessment at that level would be of some value to the system. I think it would be of some value if it was done for diagnostic reasons, not for individual certification reasons, but to, to, to see how, how the schools are doing. Um, but it's an incredibly costly enterprise, and I don't see any value that it would add. There's no reason to believe that people would get a job with a grade nine certificate who aren't getting a job with a, with a whatever they've, with their report card from their school, because in fact, the labor market is really not absorbing people at that level. The labor market 
you know, many matriculants are struggling to get a job. So it's it's not a certificate. It's not a lower certificate that people are looking for. The certificate itself isn't going to solve anything. Thank you very much indeed. Uh, Professor Stephanie Alars is the Professor of Education and Research Chair of Skills Development at the Centre for Researching Education and Labour at the Witt School of Education. Coming up in the next little while, we'll talk more about the Mpumalanga ANC. We'll talk about corporal punishment in schools. And don't forget, after 7.30, the CEO of Sunrail. You with SFM leading the conversation at 7 o'clock. In our top stories, DA's accusations against smaller parties and Hamas leaders' stance following the killing of his sons. Good morning. We start with election news. DA leader John Steenhuisen has accused smaller parties like the Patriotic Alliance of selling the votes of South Africans to the highest bidder. Steenhuisen was speaking in Easteris in Pretoria yesterday, where the party launched its Rescue South Africa roadshow. The DA says the PA sold out to the opposition in eight municipalities. The best example of these mercenary small parties is the Patriotic Alliance. The PA has sold out the opposition in eight different municipalities around the country. And as we speak tonight in this hall, they are destroying places like Neisner, like Johannesburg, like Ekuleni, in their dirty alliance with the ANC and the EFF. Meanwhile, ANC President Cyril Ramaphosa says part of the governing party's strategy to win the upcoming elections is focusing on the province of Gauteng. Four of the ANC's top bras were campaigning in the province yesterday. Ramaphosa says he will also be heading to other provinces campaigning for the ANC. Gauteng has 25% of our population, 15 million people. So many of our voters are here in Gauteng and KZN. So we've got to focus on getting people in Gauteng to register. And in the election campaign, of course, we will also be focusing on Gauteng. Government says motorists with outstanding e-toll debt will still be required to settle it even after the system is scrapped at midnight tonight. The decision came as a result of an agreement between Sandra, the Gauteng Provincial Government, and the National Treasury. The e-tolls were introduced in Gauteng in 2013 as part of the Gauteng Freeway Improvement Project. Transport Minister Sandisiwe Chikunga addressed a media briefing in Pretoria yesterday. From the 12th of April 2024, road users will no longer be charged for the use of the ETOL network. <laughs> this means that after midnight, ETOLs will no longer exist in South Africa. However, the ring roads that formed part of this scheme will remain national roads. It has been a long process we started in December 2013 after we upgraded parts of important national roads in South End. University South Africa says the impending national shutdown of tertiary institutions by student beneficiaries of the National Student Financial Aid Scheme, NASFIS, poses a significant risk to both students and the institutions. Frustrated NASFIS-funded students uh, are are planning on halting operations at universities across the country over the delayed payments of allowances. They lay the blame on controversial companies appointed as middlemen to administer NASFIS on behalf of government. Head of University South Africa's Funding Strategy Group, Professor Bismarck Jobeka. Under the circumstances, whilst the legal issues are being sorted out, let the universities do the disbursements because we have done it before. Now, concerns were raised from the side of the minister and the DHET and at NSFAS itself to say that when the universities were given the opportunity some years ago, to do this. A lot of things happened. 
And finally, Hamas political leader Ishmael Haniyeh says the jihadist group's negotiating position will not change following the killing of three of his sons by Israel. The car in which they were traveling in together with his grandchildren were destroyed in an airstrike in central Gaza yesterday. Hamas is yet to respond to the latest ceasefire proposal, but its leader said Israel was dis- delusional if it thought he would change the cause. The BBC's Sebastian Usher reports. He has essentially said that this doesn't change anything, that he has already lost members of his family. So many other Palestinians in Gaza have as well. He's not going to let this shift or change the policy that Hamas is following. And he referred this specifically to the latest ceasefire negotiations. These are at a very delicate stage. We heard some optimism a day or two ago. We're not hearing that now. And Hamas in particular has said that it doesn't think that the new proposal satisfies the conditions that it's long set out. Recapping the top story, DA leader John Steenhuisen has accused smaller parties like the Patriotic Alliance of selling the votes of South Africans to the highest bidder. Steenhuisen was speaking in Easteras in Pretoria yesterday where the party launched its Rescue South Africa Roadshow. For SFM News, I am Anne Musa. A very good morning to you in your SFM Sports Headlines Soccer. The heat is on in Durban as Orlando Pirates and Amazulu gear up for a showdown in the NetBank Cup. And you also have World Rugby. They have a potential game changer, smaller balls, to boost women's rugby. You can catch the full story just before 7.30. SAFM, guiding you through the rush hour traffic. Major delay alerts coming out of Shoshenguve, top of Pretoria this morning. The Ruth First Road that links you to and from the Mayati Mampani Highway has been closed. The MBD have got that closed down, so it's forcing traffic to go down the Hebron Road, and that is complete gridlock. Uh, nothing moving. This uh, is out by the Thorn Tree Shopping Centre, so Hebron Road going to and from the uh, Mampani Highway, heavily backed up, and routes that feed into that near the shopping centre are literally just gridlocking. If you can stay away from that, uh, you'll stand a chance at least of uh, getting to work on time. If you're in the middle of it, it really is just absolutely crazy. Nothing is moving on all approaches there. Uh, three lanes closed on Pretoria's N1 South at um, the R21 sinkhole. That's a heavy queue that continues to grow way back past the Linwood Road. And no lights on the Mopani Highway at Eski and Pathlele. So big delays on the R80 this morning into Pretoria as well. Just been a crash on the M1 North in Joburg before you get to the Bayes Nordir exit. So coming around from 14th Avenue. Uh, that's all getting quite Quite heavily backed up. Durban's M7 towards Bel Air and Wakesley, a moderate size queue this morning as you hit the roadwork section there. And uh, Cape Town, a crash on Nelson Mandela Boulevard at Searle Street is the reason for the queue coming in from Hospital Bend towards the city centre. Rob Byrne, SAFM Traffic. SAFM Sunrise. A vivid start to your day. Seven after seven. Good morning. You with SFM, SFM Sunrise. I am Stephen Critus. No, I sound a little different today. Sorry about that. Hoping the voice will hold out. Uh, we'll hear a bit more about uh, the law and corporal punishment in a moment. An important ruling coming from the Supreme Court of Appeal. And then also the ANC in Mpumalanga. Big developments there, uh, it would seem. And of course, MK quite strong in Mpumalanga too. Uh, so we'll look at that uh, as well. Uh, a lot more to come. Your mediated conversation, by the way, is around the future of plastic. And, uh, you know, every where I look, my the table, the water bottle that I have, uh, my cell phone, there's plastic everywhere. There's a TV remote in front of me, that's plastic. And we'll talk about plastic and plastic pollution in the next little while. You were there, SFM, leading the conversation. It's eight after seven. Last year, the Mars Singer hit South Africa like a storm. This year, the Mars Singer South Africa returns with 16 huge celebrities hidden behind 16 humongous masks. Get ready to be amazed and astonished with brand new masks and performances that are going to blow your mind. Don't miss the biggest television event since <laughs> season one. The Mars Singer South Africa season two premieres on S3, Saturday 6 April at 6.30 p.m. University of Johannesburg and University of the Western Cape have a mammoth task to illustrate what a pitch distinction looks like. This is the Hollywood Bet Super League. Witness the Varsity Derby, UJ Ladies FC versus UWC Ladies FC. The Sunday 14 April at 3 p.m. Live on SABC Sport on DTT Channel 4. Also available on SABC Plus and SABC Sport.com. Hashtag we love it here. Proudly brought to you by SABC Sport. Stop.
stories of the day. Hashtag SAFM Sunrise. Nine after seven. Good morning. The Supreme Court of Appeal has now ruled that the South African Council of Educators, which regulates teachers, must now take firmer action against teachers who use corporal punishment or who physically assault learners. That's after the council allowed two teachers to continue teaching and only fined them after they severely assaulted young children. In one case, the teacher hit a seven-year-old boy on the head with a PVC pipe and the child had to go to hospital. In the second case, a ten-year-old girl was slapped and beaten by a teacher ended up bleeding from her ears and yet the teachers in both cases allowed to continue teaching Stanley Malamacha is an attorney at the Centre for Child Law which brought this case Stanley, good morning Uh, Good morning uh, and good morning to your listeners These assaults on young children I mean they sound hideous as I understand it the Council for Educators only fined the teachers they were still allowed to teach what have judges said must happen now? No, yeah, I- indeed, you know, and uh, and I think before I answer uh, your question, I think uh, there's one thing that it's important for us to to clarify is that you know, the case wasn't necessarily about um, the Center for Child Law asking for harsher sentences uh, against educators who are found uh, guilty of corporal punishment or misconduct against children. Basically, what the case was about is that you know we challenged the SACE operates under what it it calls uh, the mandatory sanctions, and that is their policy that they follow when they uh, um, deal with teachers who are um, found, uh, you know, uh, wanting. And there what we challenge is that those sanctions do not actually, you know, have um, a child-centered approach. Number two, they do not take into account the best interest of the child. And number three, which is very important, they fail to impose corrective and rehabilitative uh, um, sanctions against the educators. Now, in both uh, the cases, um, you would see that none of the children uh, who were assaulted by these teachers were actually called into the into the disciplinary room and were actually given an opportunity to uh, give a side of their story. So what the sanctions also do is that they ignore or they rather, you know, do away with the child's rights to participate in any proceedings uh, um, that involve them. And that is our biggest problem. Now, what the court has said is that, number one, those sanctions are unconstitutional um, in a sense that they do not, you know, um, allow children to participate in the proceedings. Number two, they do not take into account the best interest of the child. Number three, they do not offer rehabilitative or corrective measures. And that is what we argued basically to say that you cannot allow a teacher who has been found guilty of corporal punishment to go back into the same classroom to teach the same children without giving that teacher or offering them an opportunity to undergo rehabilitative programs so that that teacher can actually learn that violence, it is not the way to correct misbehavior on learners. Did the council ever explain why it had had acted in the way that it did, that it didn't hear from the teachers, that it didn't give a stiff sanction? Did it ever actually explain itself? No, the council actually didn't explain. You know, we have been contacting the council day in, day out before we launched uh, the the review and appeal application, uh, um, you know, to say, what are the reasons? Can you provide us with the reasons why you have given identical sanctions to these two respective educators, regardless of the gravity and the distinction between the the, the two cases? And actually, what is exciting or, uh, you know, uh, for a lack of a better word, is that one of the educators actually said that they did not want to plead guilty. So one can draw an inference or a conclusion that, you know, the sanctions or this process that is undertaken by the, the council sort of like puts teachers in a corner to just say, you know what, just say you are guilty because 
nothing much is going to happen to you. What is going to happen to you is that one, we are going to uh, um, remove your name from the educator's role, but that removal is going to be suspended for 10 years, provided you are not found guilty of a similar offense. Number two, we are going to fine you uh, um, uh, uh, two months uh, or a three months uh, salary that you can uh, pay in installments. So basically, even educators who may be needing assistance to say, and, and one of the educators, if I may add, the educator said, I actually assaulted the child because I was under distress. Now you are taking that very same teacher who's still under distress and putting them in the same classroom. One, you have not even identified whether it is the teacher's working environment that is putting her under distress. So what we are arguing basically is that even our teachers, they need assistance. If we can assist our teachers uh, who are found guilty of uh, 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 corporal punishment or misconduct, we can deal with the root cause of corporal punishment. And that is what actually what the court highlighted to say, we need to deal with the root cause of corporal punishment and a failure to impose a rehabilitative sentence against a teacher or a rehabilitative mm. sanction against the teacher. We are failing in the duty because none of these teachers have been offered uh, programs uh, for, for yeah. anger management. None of them have been offered programs that introduce them to alternative sure. skills of discipline. And we do have those alternative skills of discipline, you know. Sandy, I mean, this the, the, this council, the Council for Educators, is incredibly important. It's supposed to enforce the rules against teachers that break them. And time and time and time again, we hear about teachers abusing learners, often abusing them sexually, and yet there are no sanctions. Is the council able to do its job? I mean, that that is really a, an important question. And, you know, when, when we took the council to court, the council actually argued in court that our case is moot and that it is it is rather academic because the teachers have already started saving their sentences. But now what the council, you know, does not want to acknowledge is that the policies that they operate under do, do not comply with the constitutional principles and also do not comply with international law standards, you know, such as the, 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 the laws that are under the uh, United Nations on the rights, uh, or United Nations uh, Convention on the Rights of the Child and the African Charter on the Rights and Welfare of the Child. And, you know, we, we, we try to point out to the council that when your educators are found guilty of misconduct, not only are they violating the rights, the fundamental rights of the learners, such as the right to human dignity and the right to be protected from inhumane and degrading punishment, they are also, uh, you know, are, are, are violating international law. And in that sense, then South Africa is not compliant with the international laws that it has uh, ratified. So now, you know, to answer your question very straightforward, we don't think that the council, you know, is able to do its job. And the reason why we are saying that it is because of this mandatory uh, policy, because they said, the council actually said, we are mandated by the mandatory sanctions uh, policies. And according to these policies, we are not able to exercise discretion. So it is a, for, they say that for the sanctions for, of the educators who are found wanting, so basically they just give universal sanctions. Mm. So it doesn't matter whether Stanley um, assaulted a child to a pulp and, and whether, for example, teacher Simon actually pushed the child against the chalkboard. They are going to get a universal and a straight, uh, you know, sort of like a straight jacket mm. um, sanction. Yeah. Stanley Malamachap, thank you very much indeed. Attorney at the Centre for Child Law. It's a fascinating case. 17 after 7. Agenda setting conversations of the day. The ANC in Mpumalanga says it's now suspended its provincial treasurer, Mandela Msibi, for three years. One of those years has been suspended after he and a group of other people threatened to disrupt the party's January 8th event earlier this year. It's claimed that Msibi, Buda Mdluli and Mandela Mklanga demanded that President Sir Ramaphosa travel to Pinar to meet them on the day of the actual event. Mdluli's been suspended from the party and Mklanga was found not guilty. The provincial spokesperson for the ANC in Mpumalanga is Sasakani Manzini. Sasakani, good morning. Good morning to you and to the listeners of what, the CFM. What were these people actually trying to do? Why did they demand a meeting with the president? Uh, you, you'll understand that uh, any member of the ANC can make a request, not demand, of course, uh, to 
want to engage its leaders at whatever level, depending on whether you have exhausted all the, proce- the, 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 the processes in terms of meeting certain people. But uh, indeed, you can't demand that everything must come to a standstill uh, for you to be addressed, because that can be viewed as being disruptive on its own. Okay, so was there a deliberate political act here in some way? I mean, was someone trying to uh, threaten or weaken or disrupt the president or disrupt his agenda? Uh, Hence, you you know, as an African National Congress, having said that, you have a right to want to meet any leader, but you must do it in a manner that display high level of discipline. And of course, you'll understand that we were preparing most uh, important gathering of the organization uh, where we expect all our focus and energy to be uh, mobilizing towards making that event a success. So anything that seeks to then make us not to achieve what uh, it is one of the key calendar days where we are making sure that we want to communicate to our people in terms of um, what is it that the African National Congress is going to do. So we, we believe that the manner in which it was done to say that if the president does not come and meet us, then we are not going to go there. Not only that, we are going to mobilize people in terms of not going there. So that it, it really the PEC felt it was uh, very much disruptive, hence it would warrant it, because the ANC provides in its constitution that if that uh, ill discipline happens in the organization, mm. we must uh, institute disciplinary processes in that regard. Hence, we, we started the process. They must have felt it very strongly to sort of make this a kind of threat. I'm trying to understand why someone would behave in this kind of way. I mean, was there some greater agenda here? I know there can be, you know, contested politics in Mpumalanga. Without getting into the process of disciplinary processes, but that on its own, you, you'll see there were video circulating threats in some of the members that were charged and uh, that on its own undermining the organization. Hence, uh, everyone felt that, no, we can't allow such. And also, you'll understand that it's not only ordinary members. Some of them were leadership at the level where certain expectation in terms of contributing positively towards the event. But contrary, it was uh, like uh, viewed as disruptive and confirmed by the DC uh, to say, indeed, there were some disruption and they warranted certain action in terms of the disciplinary processes, hence the verdict that we are saying uh, the P- PDC came into in terms of after the, fo- the, the process has been followed and uh, they've been given an opportunity to go and present themselves, argue their case, and then this is where we are in terms of the verdict. Okay. Uh, Mandler MCB was in the news for many reasons before this. He was charged with a double murder at one point. Those charges were withdrawn. Does this suspension mean he can't hold office in the provincial government? I mean, he was an MEC previously. I presume he can't hold office in the province as well. Yes, the, we are now as an organization processing the matter whether uh, in terms of the constitution government, what then must happen. But you know that uh, over and above that, there is still a 21 days that they are afforded if they want to appeal. But they, the, the, the ANC in the province will then regulate in terms of what then be his participation in government as a deploy of the African National Congress. And only a candidate in good standing, only a person in good standing in the ANC could be a candidate for the elections in Mpumalanga. Is that right? So so unless something changes, if this verdict stands, he won't be able to stand as a candidate in Mpumalanga in the elections. Hence, I'm saying that that will then be the process of the ANC in terms of what happened. Uh, of course, after the lapse of the, the, his, cost, his constant right in terms of what then happens within the 21 days, but then the ANC will have then to take a decision based on now and moving forward in terms of uh, the next general election and the candidate that will represent the African National Congress in government looking at all the standing. Remember, mm-hmm. uh, we can anything can happen from now mm-hmm. up until uh, the, 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 the finalization of uh, the people that will represent mm-hmm. the ANC. So 
it, it is going to still be going to be looked in terms of all its members uh, as it in, as in their status when we go to the next coming uh, uh, government in terms of the list process and all that. Mandler and CB seem to have a strong constituency in the ANC in Mpumalanga. I mean, he was elected uh, to his position. Are you worried there'll be a, a political reaction to this? The, the the members of the ANC and the supporters of the ANC, I believe that they love us, they support us when we are still in good standing, being members of the ANC. So in the ANC, sometimes you might mistaken yourself being loved because you are a member of the ANC, but once the ANC takes a decision we, 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 in, in any platform in terms of the members of the ANC, people are very much disciplined. Members are disciplined, they understand the processes, hence it is going to be communicated to the members of the ANC. And once it's communicated, remember when you join the ANC, you join the ANC as an individual and you respect the constitution of the ANC. So once the ANC acts in a certain way and takes certain decisions, it is only disciplined discipline members of the ANC that will follow the ANC and not a person. Because when you join the ANC and support a person, I believe you are supporting them because they are leaders, because they are members of the ANC, disciplined members of the ANC. So I don't think that... Uh, uh, of course, any person, there are people that will sympathize with you being a leader, but with the program that we've put in place, we are very much focusing on the election. Our structures are on the ground. Okay. We believe that, the, remember, as an ANC, there's a collective sure. Uh, sure. uh, uh, program sure. and implementation, not an individual. Even if you're the president, uh, people are following you because you're the president well, and they're following well, the program of the ANC that is implemented at time. You've made my next question much easier to ask. The fact is is that many people, it seems, do love former President Jacob Zuma and they followed him as an individual away from the ANC. I mean, Mandela Msibi may be one, I don't know. But in Mpumalanga, aren't you feeling the heat from MK at the moment precisely because people are following a leader, Zuma, and not the ANC? Yes, we, we, we understand that there are people that will follow a certain leader, but we are just from the by-election at... Uh, M. Kondo, at, at Government, sorry. So looking at whether the MK is only the ANC that will then lose its voters, it's not true. Uh, people always move around uh, different political parties. Of course, we agree that uh, there are members of the ANC also from the province of Mpumalanga that have joined MK, but we still believe, even if that's the case, we'll make sure that we are uh, focusing on voter contact. All When you go to a voter, we don't go to the voters that are voters of Sasekan. We are going to each and every voter, VD per VD, and make sure, sure that uh, we campaign for them to vote for the ANC and tell a good story in terms of what the African okay, has done. Okay, but you... Not what Sasekan has done as an individual, okay, but, but what the ANC has done. Sasekan, you're going to lose votes to MK, aren't you? I mean, in the elections. That seems, in Mpumalanga, they seem to be a big threat to you. All political parties are going to lose voters to other uh, political parties. The fact is not only, only the African National Congress that will lose voters to MK, DA will lose voters to ANC, EFF will lose voters to DA. So we, our responsibility is to do voter contact and make sure that we tell a good story of what we've to we have done. That's what we are focusing on as an African National Congress. Not individuals and political parties. We only focus on uh, conversing door-to-door, voter-to-voter, and make sure that our people understand why our manifesto is the best in, in, in the country for them to vote for the African National Congress. Sasa Kani Manzini, thank you very much indeed. Spokesperson for the ANC in Mpumalanga, 27 minutes after 7. This is SAFM Sport with Zai Khan. Zai, good morning. Looking ahead to the Nedbank quarterfinals. Yes, Stephen, it's a Spanish showdown in Durban as Amazulu and Pirates coaches are going to bring the fire to the pitch. Now, uh, Amazulu and Orlando Pirates, there'll be the Latin temperament on full display, especially in the technical areas with Jose Rivero heading up Pirates. Pablo Martin is the coach for Amazulu. Now, Rivero, he knows it won't be a walk in the park. Uh, Amazulu is a, is a team that we, we do respect a lot. Experienced players, players that prove uh, already many times that uh, they are excellent players with a good level, competitive, uh, 
an away game, there's all the conditions to understand that it's not going to be a, a walk in the park for us. Soccer action last night saw the Brazil forward Rapinha, who scored twice helping Barcelona secure a 3-2 win at Paris Saint-Germain in their Champions League quarterfinal first leg. Also, Atletico Madrid, they held off a late Borussia Dortmund fight back to have a slender 2-1 advantage in their first leg of their Champions League quarterfinal. Cricket, the Hollywood Bets, Dolphins secured a narrow 3 well, three-run win, that's according to the DLS method, against the Multiplied Titans at the Hollywood Bets Kingsmead in Durban. The Titans opted to field first as the host ended the innings on 127 for six in their allotted 20 overs. Jason Smith top scored with an unbeaten 28 with Kaya Zondo and Bradley Porteous also in their 20s with 21 runs each. Now, the Dolphins' bowling attack was just as clinical, restricting the Titans to 74 for five before play was called off, and that was due to inclement weather. The players returned to the field with a revised target of 104, with the Titans needing 30 runs from two overs and the Dolphins eventually clinching a narrow win. On to athletics, where the world 400-meter hurdles champion, Carsten Warholm, has hedged his bets about the possibility of breaking his own record at the Paris Olympics, but saying that new running spikes has also developed his uh, uh, confidence. In 2019, I was very close to world record. Everybody was talking about it, but it didn't happen. And I think when you're, at, when you're going at the starting line, if your focus is to get the world record, I think it's going to be more difficult because it doesn't happen when you tighten up and do and do everything you can it it uh, it is um, it is a result of everything going the right way at the right day and finally rugby in a move that could reshape the women's rugby game England coach John Mitchell has endorsed the trial of smaller rugby balls, a potential benefit for player recruitment. World Rugby is set to delve into data from the Six Nations Under-18 Women's Festival, examining the benefits of a ball that's 3% smaller and 4% lighter than the current size. And that's how we wrap up your sport on Sunrise. More top of the hour, I'm Zai Khan. Really have to behave myself. <laughs> you with this FM leading the conversation. We'll speak to the CEO at Sunrail in the next half an hour. It's day 15 of No Load Shedding 7.30. Good morning in the headlines. Former President Jacob Zuma will today be at the High Court in Johannesburg in, his, in the case of his private prosecution bid against President Cyril Ramaphosa. DA leader John Steenhuisen has accused smaller parties like the Patriotic Alliance of selling the votes of South Africans to the highest bidder. He was speaking in Easteris in Pretoria yesterday where the party launched its Rescue South Africa roadshow. And the airport's company South Africa has moved to dispel reports of an imminent fuel shortage at some of its airports. I'll have details on these and other stories at 8. SAFM Guiding you through the rush hour traffic. Just an update from Shosha and Guve, TMPD, uh, TMPD, 20 Metro Police Department have been in touch and just confirming the closure of the uh, Ruth First Road to and from the uh, Montpellier Highways because of a low hanging uh, electricity cable. So, very dangerous. The Ruth First is closed. And what it means if you're the top end of Shosha and Guve, you've got to divert further south and hook into the Hebron Road, uh, which is your access point to and from the Montpellier Highway. And that is an absolute, what we call in this business, a hot mess. Hardly anything moving around Thorn Tree, around that dive. So if you're around sort of the, the top end, you normally use Ruth first. Uh, just come out, take some alternative uh, routes, maybe go backwards, hit, hit the Hebron Road, then down Doreen Avenue. Worst thing you can do is go straight into sort of Thorn Tree because it'll take forever uh, to get out of that area. It's very heavily back this morning. Uh, staying in Cap City, there's a major delay alert. If you use the N1 South, saw this yesterday, seeing it uh, carrying into today. It's an additional lane closure on the, R2, on the N1 South at the R21 at the sinkhole. And that traffic's almost all the way back uh, through towards the N4 Emily Highway. Uh, crash on Solomon Mishlangu uh, this morning and a bit of a police operation as well. If you're driving uh, Pretoria East, just factor in some queue time on Solomon Mishlangu. Crash on Joburg's M1 North going up to Bayers Nordia. Traffic arriving from Soweto stuck in a queue that extends right back as far as 14th Avenue. Durban's N3 inbound. Saw this yesterday as well. Seeing it again this morning. Uh, very heavy backlogs from Pavilion Mall through Spaghetti Junction to Sherwood. We think it's roadwork related and a change up in the lane restrictions around four level, but it is heavy if you're Durban bound. And driving into K 
taped out an earlier crash on Nelson Mandela Boulevard at Searle Street. It's the reason for heaviness on the N2. The queue starts at Langer through Hospital Bend and in towards the city centre. Uh, use Philip Cosana, the M3 split in the top of town uh, from Hospital Bend to avoid the queues on Nelson Mandela. Rob Byrne, SAFM Traffic. The business update on SAFM. Welcome again to In Taoleng, Le Chele in Taoleng. Good morning, Asian markets, US markets. How's it all looking? Stephen, volatility is the name of the game. Let's kick things off in Asia. Those stocks tracking Wall Street, trading mostly in the red. Japan's Nikkei falling close to 0.4%. Hong Kong's Hang Seng also in negative territory. Backing the overall trend, however, is China's Shanghai Index, which is trading in the green up 0.5%. U.S. futures in the meantime are mixed as traders shift rate cut expectations to September. This, of course, on U.S inflation which has continued to be sticky the rand also losing steam on the back of that inflation print trading above 1870 to the dollar local markets are also expected to have a downbeat day after closing flat in yesterday's trade and then uh, ellie's the electrical equipment makers they're filing for liquidation Yes, things aren't looking good for Ellie Stevens. Some might even say it's the end of the road. The group released a statement saying that it'll be shutting down uh, after operating for 45 years. Quick history on the group. Um, Ellie's is an electronics company, as you mentioned. It deals with satellites and aerial equipment. That side of the business, however, came under strain as we saw a slowdown in DSTV installations. Now, in an attempt to boost profits, Ellie's turned to alternative energy as so South Africa was dealing with a energy crisis. The group um, started selling inverters and solar panels. It was also looking to acquire Bundu Power, which would support its move further into alternative energy. But that deal fell through, which then saw it file for voluntary business rescue in January. Close to three months later, Ellie's has filed for liquidation, which will result in the company delisting from the JSC. However, all is not lost. According to a Business Day article, the Ellie's brand will continue in business rescue until a plan is released next month. And it seems like there's interest from potential bidders who could carry on the brand and also keep help keep staff employed. And then there's another JSC uh, delisting. MC Mining is considering a, taking, a takeover offer. Yes, the circumstances, however, aren't as bad as what we're seeing at Ellie's junior coal miner MC Mining could be de- ditching the JC. This comes after Gold uh, Capital Investment made an off- off-market bid offering shareholders 16 Australian dollar cents per share, which valued the company at 65.3 million Australian dollars. Now, since the offer was made, the investment firm has acceptances of just over 83% from MC mining shareholders this now means the offer is unconditional and so mc mining's mining board has advised its shareholders to consider selling the remainder of the company's shares to goldway before the takeover is finalized in Taoleng, thanks very much indeed in Taoleng, Le Chela, uh, with us of course now uh, on your business updates and she'll be back again tomorrow there'll be more business news through the day here don't forget jimmy moya later this evening 24 minutes now to eight Call us on 086-000-2032. Then, of course, the number, lots going on. Uh, you heard from the ANC in Mpumalanga earlier. Conversations, too, around teachers and corporal punishment. Carbon capture, which is not really a conversation I ever thought we would have on talk radio. The other big issue, of course, this morning is if you live in Gauteng and if you ever travel in a vehicle with an e-tag, you'll be used to the sound of a beep as you go uh, under the overhead gantries on the highways that have been e told up until now. From tomorrow, well, you won't hear the beep anymore. The gantries are being switched off at midnight tonight. Finally, the government switching off the entire system. But yesterday, the transport minister, Sindasiwa Chukunga, saying people who had run up debts through not paying for their e-tolls will still be liable for that debt under the law. The CEO of South African National Roads Agency Limited, Sunral, is Reginald Damana. Reginald, good morning. Uh, good morning to you, sir, and your listeners. The ETO situation's been hanging around Sunrail's neck for a long time. I mean, in one way, I wonder, is it a little bit of a relief now that you know what's actually going to happen? Yes, yeah, certainly. We we are celebrating uh, this certainty that uh, tonight at midnight we are switching off. You will also see that uh, the resolution of ETO has also meant that National Treasury approves our borrowing limits 
which will allow us to go to private markets and raise funding to maintain and expand our toll portfolio. So certainly uh, very welcome relief for Sandra and also certainty to the end of this equal scheme. The gantries are staying up. What are you going to use them for? The gantries will stay up very useful uh, infrastructure and camera technology. We are able to read uh, license plate numbers, which means uh, we can use them for crime fighting. Uh, we can read plates. We can see stolen vehicles. We also have a network of cameras along the, the route, uh, which we use to monitor traffic, emergency requirements. Um, and going forward, we may also use this to do average speed over distance or so speed prosecution. Uh, in addition, helping uh, other uh, uh, entities such as the Johannesburg Municipality, Jobek Metro, they want access to the data, which they may also use for crime fighting purposes. So very useful infrastructure going forward. And Reginald, I realize this is a sort of hot topic. For the people who paid their e-tolls over the years, is there any provision? You're not going to pay them back, are you? I'm also one. I have a very much up-to-date account. I am waiting for a policy decision on whether refunds will be done or not in due course once government has consulted. They indicated that there will be a consultation of interested and affected stakeholders in the public, and a decision will be made. That will also include uh, uh, seeing whether uh, the, the, the historic debt will also be pursued going forward. So I'm also waiting patiently uh, for that decision. Okay, because I mean, I don't think that, I mean, I mean, I can do the consultation for you now. Everybody who paid the money wants it back. <laughs> I mean, I mean there's, there's, there's no doubt in my mind that everyone who paid it wants it back. So, okay, consultation tick. Um, but, I mean, the minister on the one side doesn't seem to be saying there'll be a refund. And on the other side, um, she seems to say that people who didn't pay will still be liable for the debt. It can't work both ways, it would seem. Yeah, of course, um, uh, uh, Stephen, from where, how we understand it is that if you refund, uh, you cannot pursue debt. If you don't refund, you must pursue debt. That's an equitable way of dealing with the situation. However, a uh, finality must still be done and, and a policy announcement must be, must be made. Having said that, the law as it is currently uh, those who have debt are still obligated to pay. We will, however, not be prosecuting as we haven't been doing that since March 2019 when the board decided not to do that. Um, and so we rely on those who have accounts to pay, uh, good South Africans out there, um, and until a decision is made on that. Okay, well, I mean... Reginald, maybe you're a kinder and nicer person than I am because if people didn't pay while the system was working, they're not going to pay when the system isn't working. I mean, government. I mean, I think government has to come to terms with the fact it's never going to get that money. I can't. I can't say. I can't say. Even, uh, I've been paying, uh, and I'm <laughs> sure I know a lot of people who have been paying. Okay, um, I, can, I can see that. You know, in a way, I'm asking you questions above your pay grade, so I understand that to an extent the situation you're in. The highways between Joburg and Tswane, they're there. They're very busy. They need a lot of maintenance. How's that going to work? Are you still responsible for the maintenance, or is it the province? And, and does this take us back to your point about how uh, Treasury has increased your spending limits? Yeah, certainly. Uh, the, the, the roads remain national roads. They just move from toll portfolio into non-toll portfolio. They will remain owned, operated, and maintained by Sandra. We have two types of uh, maintenance that we, we, we want to do. The backlog maintenance, like what we are doing on the R21, uh, where the resurfacing of the road was long overdue, that backlog maintenance uh, will continue to be done in the next three to four years across the entire network of Eton, uh, and it will cost us four billion over four years. How then province will pay for that uh, as and when uh, we require to do that? The ongoing maintenance uh, for the rest of the network's life, I would imagine, uh, will continue to be funded by the national treasury grants that we receive. Uh, similar to what we do for the uh, rest of the non toll portfolio. So national government will take care for that. Houting is only taking care for the immediate 
backlog maintenance to resurface the network. Thank you very much indeed. Reginald Damana is the CEO at Sunroll. Very difficult job at the moment, I think. 17 minutes to eight. Last year, the Mars Singer hit South Africa like a storm. This year, the Mars Singer South Africa returns with 16 huge celebrities hidden behind 16 humongous masks. Get ready to be amazed and astonished with brand new masks and performances that are going to blow your mind. Don't miss the biggest television event since <laughs> season one. The Mars Singer South Africa season two premieres on S3, Saturday 6 April at 6.30 p.m. South Africa is facing an increase in people diagnosed with non-communicable diseases such as diabetes, cancers, hypertension, lung problems and obesity. This also increases the number of people living with these diseases and mental health. Many people living with these preventable diseases may not be immediately aware unless they go for health screening and testing. It is our responsibility to invest in our healthier future through regular physical activity, healthy diets and avoiding risky health behaviours such as alcohol and tobacco use. The Department of Health urges people to go for regular health screening for early detection and effective treatment if they are diagnosed with any of these conditions. This message is brought to you by the National Department of Health. Mummy Lodi Sundown's ladies believe they belong at the top and they want the vital three points. But Linda Lani ladies are on a mission to shock Banyana Bas style. This is the Hollywood Bet Super League. Witness the queens of the beautiful game. Mummy Lodi Sundown's ladies FC versus Linda Lani ladies FC. The Sunday 14 April at 11 a.m. Live on SABC Sport on DTT Channel 4. Also available on SABC Plus and SABC Sport.com. Hashtag We Love It Here. Proudly brought to you by SABC Sport. For the love of the game. Call us on 086 000 Mbiyeswa on the line from Soweto. Mbiyeswa, hi. Itos, how are you feeling about them this morning? Yes, I'm good. On you. I, I have just an idea for them on how to pay back those people that paid yeah. uh, their Itos. Uh, one idea is that when these people go and renew their licenses, then that, that, that those monies are set off from, from, from the Itos. That's a That's very good idea. idea. I'd never even thought of that. That's yeah. a great idea, yeah. Or, 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 yeah, or maybe their tickets are deducted or set off from, yeah. from what they used to, to, to pay. Thank you very much, Stephen. All right, Mbiyeswa, well, thank you. I'd never thought of that. I never quite understood why we have to pay for a license disc anyway, because no one checks anything on it, but that's just me. Uh, Moses on the line from Bramley. I'm sure you're a big fan of Itos, Moses. Hey, morning, Stephen. How are you? I'm well. Go for it. So, it all, Stephen. These people, they never consulted us. Yeah. At first, when they actually they put this country. Mm. Now, they have said they are, they are going to uh, to to stop this it all now. They are telling us, those of us who have been traveling on this freeway, going to work and coming back from work, that we still have got a bill to mm. pay. Mm. I think it's crazy, man. We didn't pay this at all at first. Now, how should we pay now when they've just discussed mm. this thing? Mm. Yeah, all right. No. Okay. The, the whole thing is a bit strange to me. Moses on the line from Bramley. Thank you. Kabile on the line from Kabecha. Hi. Uh, load shedding. 15 days of no load shedding. How do you feel about it? <laughs> morning, Stephen, and morning to the listeners. Um, when you made that statement, I was thinking, no, Stephen is lying. That's not true. The reason why I say that when I'm based in PE or Kabeha, uh, but I am from Gwambonambi um, near Richard Spain, KZN. Yeah. So each time these announcements are made that there's not going to be load shedding for a certain number of days, like around holidays and, and so forth, we actually get, well, my parents get um, uh, cut off. Like they don't get electricity for four hours. So it's actually better when it's announced that there's load shedding because um, they would be load shed as it is announced, like no electricity sure. for two hours at a time. But if we hear that there's no load shedding, so even on ESCOM to push app, you, it'll be showing that there's no load shedding, but mm. electricity, I guarantee you, would go at 5 and come back at 9 every day. So, so why, 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 days, why are you getting uh-huh. load shedding when the, Why is your power being switched off when there's not supposed to be load shedding or for your parents? Um, I'm not sure, but I think this is my personal view. I think we get our electricity direct from uh, ESCOM, not from the municipality. Yeah. So the area is a uh, travel area outside the town of Richards Bay. So we got electricity before the municipality could, could provide that service. So we get our electricity directly from ESCOM. So I think mm. they can just do as they please. Like on Christmas Day, we did not have electricity the whole day. 
Mm. On New Year's Day, we do not have electricity sure. the whole day. On the 21st of March, this holiday. So we think somebody just switches. All right, Kabila, we seem to have lost you on the line there, but okay, yeah, I can hear the frustration, of course, uh, very much so. All right, Kabila, thank you. Uh, Bongani and Pumalanga, you want to talk about Bongi and Kosi Kanile, who was removed yesterday as convener of the Youth League of Umkonto Wasizwe? Yes, good morning, ST. Yes, I just want to weigh in on that. You know what, I don't know if they don't want to um, tell the truth that maybe they fire the guy or something like mm. that, because if I can see the press conference when he... he, 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 he he, he, he addressed the press conference. There was a background of a pamphlet, and that pamphlet was having his face on it. And now the face is only Jacob Zuma, I understand, in the, mm. any political party. So now they see how the, the, the former uh, ANC Youth League president, uh, Julius Malema, uh, started with his uh, trying to... Uh, uh, to have a part within the party. So mm. now the ANC, yes, Jacob Zuma and, and the other guys, they fire him. So the, the, the guy, I think he, he crossed the line. Then yeah. they don't want to say that uh, he's already fired because he was starting to have those mm. um, similar uh, entities like uh, Julius Malema when he was in the uh, youth league of the ANC. Thank you very much. Uh, uh, All right. Bongani, thank you. On the line from Pumalanga. Let's see how that plays out. I don't know how it will uh, play out. Uh, Kirk on the line from Cape Town. Etolls. Hi, Kirk. Good morning. Um, I live in Cape Town, so there's no Etolls here. So yeah. Thank goodness we were exempt from that debacle. Um, however, I used to travel to Johannesburg for work and would use hired cars. And um, I know that the company cars for the company I worked for were also tagged. So yeah. corporates were paying and hired car companies were paying ETOLs. Or oh, while well, they were being tagged, I don't know if they were paying, yeah. but I presume that those are the only people who really paid. What I would re- really like to ask, has anybody investigated the balance sheet of ETOLs? What was, how much was collected? Who was paid? How were they paid? How much are they still mm. outstanding? That Austrian company that was initially... Um, the financier, yeah. apparently, of this whole deal. Um, has anybody ever done any? Homework? I think I think outer of the people to speak to Kirk. Uh, I'm, I'm sure all of that stuff is publicly available anyway on the Central Annual Reports and things like that. But my, I know from time to time, Wayne Duvernay Jadata has sort of given us hard numbers on collection rates and money outstanding and things like that. It'll be very interesting to see now yeah. what that, or how that ends up, yeah. what the final number is. All right, no, Kirk and Cape Town is an important question. Thank you. Nine minutes to eight. SAFM, guiding you through the rush hour traffic. Down in Pumalanga, there's a very unusual traffic queuing right in the centre of Bethel. There's a wood-carrying truck and it's on fire. Uh, so right by the police station. So we're talking central Bethel, uh, the N17. Traffic uh, backing and stacking both directions. If you're on your way through Bethel, expect a delay to get through the uh, town area. Uh, very heavy traffic. Pretoria East, just a heads up. Solomon Mishlangu coming through from Limwood Road. Uh, big backlogs on your way down towards Karsfontein and Limwood Road into Solomon Mishlangu is quite uh, heavy as well. Uh, collision scene in the Hatfield area. Stands about Papi at Young's show, but that's causing just general delays in the area. And if you're just joining us to miss the earlier updates, a low-hanging electricity wire uh, in Shoshenguve has closed the Ruth First Highway. It looks like it might have been reopened, uh, but it was closed, and during the closure it forced a lot of traffic down around the uh, Hebron Road and uh, Thorn Tree uh, Mall area, so really heavily congested routes in that part of Shoshenguve this morning. Uh, Jerbo got a crash on the M1 North at Bayers Nordia. Traffic coming through from Soweto sits in a queue from 14th Avenue. Once you get past that, you get to Malabongwe, and that's heavy around to Ravonia Road and up to Sunning Hill this morning. Lights are down on um, William Mandela and Bryanston Drive, so some additional delays coming out of four ways uh, into that uh, Bryanston area. Uh, Durban, we saw this yesterday, seeing it again this morning. Very heavy on the N3. We think it's probably roadworks related. A little change up around Spaghetti Junction. So the N3 inbound sits from Pavilion through uh, Spaghetti Junction down towards the uh, Sherwood area. And came down an earlier crash on Nelson Mandela Boulevard going into town uh, just by Searle Street. That's causing a big pushback right through to sort of Young Smuts Drive in the um, in the Athlone area. So from there all the way down to Searle Street to that crash on Nelson Mandela's Heavy. You might want to offer up at Hospital Bend and take Philip Corsana uh, going to town that way and avoid uh, Nelson Mandela. Also just to mention the M3 is fairly heavy this morning. Queues from uh, top of sort of Weinberg Hill right through to the UCT exit. Rob Byrne, SAFM Traffic.
Two years since winning the EFC middleweight title in the most dramatic and controversial fashion, Luke Michael finally defends his belt for the very first time at EFC 112 against the imposing submission machine, J.P. Kruger. And in the co-main event, featherweight champion Iga Smiley Cabessa becomes the next athlete aiming for champ champ status as he battles the imposing Kaleka Block Cabanda. EFC 112 live this Thursday. Watch it on SABC Sport Channel on DTT Channel 4 from 7 p.m. Brought to you by SABC Sport. Imagine if you could save time like you save money. A second here, a minute there. Type a little faster, walk a little faster. Or you could stop scrolling on the internet. Just think of all the hours you'll save. Now what if you could take all that time and invest it? Watch it grow. Until eventually, one day, you'd have so much time that you wouldn't know what to do with it all. But unfortunately, time doesn't work like that. It can't be stored or banked. And unlike money, you can't make it back. That's why after 50 years of investing, we've learned that time is the greatest gift of all. And the good news is, if you invest early, time gives you money. And then money gives you more time to do whatever you want to do. Even if it is scrolling on the internet. Ellen Gray. Long-term investing. Ellen Gray is an authorized FSP. University of Johannesburg and University of the Western Cape have a mammoth task to illustrate what a pitch distinction looks like. This is the Hollywood Bet Super League. Witness the Varsity Derby. UJ Ladies FC versus UWC Ladies FC. The Sunday 14 April at 3 p.m. Live on SABC Sport on DTT Channel 4. Also available on SABC Plus and SABC Sport.com. Hashtag we love it here. Proudly brought to you by SABC Sport. Conversations that you connect with and react to. SAFM. Five minutes to eight now the time. Well, lots of conversations over the last little while about how to ensure that as many people vote as possible. And you'll know that, like in other countries, our young people often simply do not vote. Kalisa Social Solutions has been speaking to younger people, uh, trying to sort of get an understanding of all of this. Leslie Ann van Selm is the founder and managing director at Kalisa Social Solutions. Leslie Ann, good morning. Good morning. <clears throat> Thanks for having me on the show. You and I have the same voice problem this morning. Um, we know that around the world, younger people are less likely to vote. And in fact, this has often changed the outcome of elections. In Britain, it changed the out- outcome of the referendum on whether to leave the European Union or not. What do young people here say about why they don't vote? Do they just not feel part of the system? I think it's a disillusionment. It's the broken promises and the ecosystems in which they're living the the total brokenness. Um, they've been failed by the education system. They've been failed by the service system. Um, there's a lack of recreation, and in fact, the total brokenness in in our country, which our which our youth are being subjected to, which has created disillusion and a total lack of hope, and the apathy to actually go out and vote because they just don't believe in in our leadership in the country. In a way, I suppose they may also just see no option, no sort of realistic option for change. And isn't that sort of the hopelessness you're talking about? Totally, totally. And I think it's so important moving forward is to actually um, invert the pyramid and say to the youth, what would you be doing around the corruption? What would you be doing to address the inequality, the poverty, the the um, the nepotism? What, what are your solutions? And I think if we can start working towards that for the next elections, we could have a whole fresh new approach in terms of new policies and new approaches. And I, I, I really feel that that's the only way that we're going to be able to address this. When you're young, you're supposed to believe that you, you know, many people when they're young, and we've seen this in previous generations, believe that they can uh, change the world, that, you know, they're, they're fairly optimistic. And as you get older, you get, well, I suppose, a bit like, bit like me, grey and cynical. I and mean, there's something kind of awful about um, younger people who feel the situation is so bad, it's not even worth voting. Absolutely. And I mean, when you when you look at young people, you know, there are no jobs available. Where, where is the hope? There's the latest thing of, you know, the government employing young people on stipends. They haven't been paid um, ever since they were contracted. It's just that constant being bombarded from every single corner is just where do you go? And and who do you talk to? Because, you know, our councils are so corrupt. There's, there's so little 
help in even getting our municipalities to provide services and water and 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 support services the crime is at its, at its all-time high so it's just this 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 incessant hopelessness that's pervading our lives and our youth are the victims I wonder sometimes, and I wonder if they would be right to, if younger people would be right to blame, you know, my generation, um, to sort of say that you've failed us, that actually to grow up as a young person now is harder than it was maybe 20 years ago, which is a terrible thing to say if you look at our history. Well, I'm I'm afraid to say that that's what a lot of the adults are saying to me. It was better before because at least things were functional. Um, There wasn't the democracy in place but but things worked and and there was still there was still hope that there would be a future and it's it's really it's 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 getting worse day by day and what's great about the media is exposure that the media is constantly showing and uh, you know that that people have got to be held accountable but also we you know we've got we've got to only not only look at the government but also as you said all of us together because we you know we're working in an or living in an ecosystem and the ecosystem is comprised of civil society of individuals of business of government and it, it's the only way we're ever going to solve the problem in our country is we start looking from an ecosystem point of view where people break down the silos, corporates look at aligned visions, address problems in a in a unified way, and only then will we be able to start seeing the wheel changing because we can't work in isolation. We can't look at one department without looking at how we can work together. So everybody in this country has got to pull together in order to change the status that we, that, um, we are actually facing now. Leslie Ann van Selm, thank you. Founder and Managing Director at Colisa Social. Really appreciate the time. In a moment, we will speak to the person who lodged the objection with the Electoral Commission against former President Jacob Zuma. As far as I know, he hasn't actually spoken in public about this. That's coming up in the next few minutes. You're with SFM leading the conversation. It's 8 o'clock. In our top stories, private prosecution case against Ramaphosa back in court and DA slams smaller parties. Good morning. Former President Jacob Zuma will today be at the High Court in Johannesburg in the case of his private prosecution bid against President Cyril Ramaphosa. The matter was postponed in December last year. Zuma is accusing his successor of failing to act pro- against prosecutor advocate Billy Downer and journalist Karen Morn for allegedly disclosing his medical details in violation of the NPA Act. Zuleka Kodashe reports. Former President Jacob Zuma will seek to keep his private prosecution case on the roll when he goes to the criminal court this morning. This in a series of legal attempts to privately prosecute the president. Ramaphosa last year successfully sought the court's intervention to review and set aside the bid by his predecessor, a move Zuma sought to appeal before the full bench of the High Court and lost. The former president then petitioned the Supreme Court of Appeal, but the appellate court dismissed it. Zuma has since asked the appeals court to reconsider. The Jacob Zuma Foundation says its patron will update the High Court on this progress when he appears before it as a private prosecutor. In election news... DA leader John Steenhuisen has accused smaller parties like the Patriotic Alliance of selling the votes of South Africans to the highest bidder. He was speaking in Easterus in Pretoria yesterday where the party launched its Rescue South Africa Roadshow. The best example of these mercenary small parties is the Patriotic Alliance. The PA has sold out the opposition in eight different municipalities around the country. And as we speak tonight in this hall, they are destroying places like Neisner, like Johannesburg, like Ekuleni, in their dirty alliance with the ANC and the EFF. Leader of Rise Mzanzi, Songezo Zibi, says the solution to alleviate the unemployment rate and grow the economy is by offering people training opportunities that will enable them to acquire the necessary skills. He was speaking at the Cape Town Press Club yesterday where he was unpacking his party's ongoing election campaign ahead of the national general elections next month. He says good leadership 
implementation, effective governance and where to deploy money remain the best ways to create jobs. If you don't have a skill, it's incredibly difficult to get anything other than a peace job. So that's why we talk about there's four training opportunities for people with either no metric or with metric so that they have a basis for looking for a job. Otherwise, it's really hopeless for them. I think I've given you an idea for our integrated approach to helping the economy grow. The Western Cape Department of Education say there is one day left for parents to register their children online for Grade 1 and 8 for the 2025 academic year. Provincial Education MEC David Meneer says admissions for these two grades closes tomorrow at midnight. Meneer says the department has already received more than 80,000 applications for Grade 1 and 8 learners. We appeal to parents who have not yet applied to do so by Friday so that their applications will be on time. Receiving all the applications on time will make a big difference to our planning and preparation for 2025. Don't wait. Apply today. The airport's company, South Africa, has moved to dispel reports of an imminent fuel shortage at some of its airports. It attributes the reports to a misunderstanding of the situation. Rianda Maume has more. AXA says it has requested to assist on behalf of the South African Petroleum Industry Association with respect to ongoing engagements between SAPIA, the South African Revenue Service, and individual petroleum companies to resolve a tax dispute relating to the use of the multi-product pipeline from Deben to Johannesburg and related storage facilities. It says the inland refinery, which is also the main source of jet fuel into our Tambo International Airport, is preparing for its planned temporary shutdown sometime between May and June this Year, leading to a greater reliance on imported fuel from Durban. It has moved to reassure stakeholders that it is taking all necessary precautions to deal with and mitigate any potential crisis. And finally, Muslims across South Africa are celebrating Eid al-Fitr today, marking the end of the holy month of Ramadan. The day is marked with early morning prayers, feeding the needy and visiting family and friends and the graves of loved ones. In Cape Town, at the Gatesville Mosque in Athlone, prayers and a sermon will be offered under the theme Celebration and Commemoration in Solidarity with the Palestinian People. The summit continued bombing and an unfolding humanitarian crisis in Gaza. Recapping the top story, former President Jacob Zuma will today be at the High Court in Johannesburg in the case of his private prosecution bid against President Cyril Ramaphosa. For SFM News, I am Anne Musa. A very good morning to you in your SFM Sports Headlines. Soccer, Amatuk set their sights on making history in the NetBank Cup quarterfinals against Mamelodi Sundowns. And the family of slain Kaiser Chiefs defender Luke Fleurs may find closure as police confirm the arrest of six suspects in connection with his murder. Stay tuned for the details coming up just before 8.30. SAFM, guiding you through the rush hour traffic. Update from Shoshan Guve. Uh, the Ruth First Road to and from the Mopoli Highway looks like it's reopened, but during the closure, left a lot of traffic uh, diverting down towards the Hebron Road to get out of Shoshan Guve. Uh, the mesh around Thorn Tree is quite unbelievable. Major, major backlogs coming out of Shoshan Guve that side. Uh, the N4 on towards uh, Hatfield's queuing this morning from Rousseau Street uh, down through the N1 and then in towards sort of Pretoria Street. Big queues. Uh, into that part of Pretoria. There's also been a crash on the Unshopa at Stance of Opapi, uh, just adding to the delay. Days in that part of uh, Pretoria this morning. Uh, the M1 North, a crash at Bay is Nordir a little bit earlier, just slowing traffic coming up from 14th Avenue. A uh, crash on the N12 and R24 routes coming into Galulis. Both of those uh, routes are queuing up the closer you get to Galulis. And a collision just at Heldenace on the N3. So all of a sudden we're backlogging, coming up from Germiston and Alberton, passing the cement factory territory. Uh, Durban, the Kumashu Highway down through Duffs Road, over the N2 on to Chris Harney, uh, looking slow. It's probably traffic light related this morning. And Cape Town side, that collision on Nelson Mandela Bull about halfway into town by Searle Street. Still backlogging traffic. N2 slow from Jan Smuts. M3 from UCT. And a bit of traffic diverting on the Philip Cosana option to avoid the N2. Just jamming up through towards Mill Street and the CBD as well. Rob Byrne, SAFM Traffic. SAFM Sunrise. 
A vivid start to your day. Seven after eight. Good morning. You're with SFM, SFM Sunrise. I'm Stephen Crutus. is me. I know I sounded a little different today. Sorry about that. Well, in a few moments, you'll hear from the person who actually lodged the appeal, or lodged the objection, rather, the individual who lodged the objection against the candidacy of former President Jacob Zuma from Konto I think it could be quite an important interview. Other conversations to come, including the future of plastic from 8.30. Stick around for that. Two years since winning the EFC middleweight title in the most dramatic and controversial fashion, Luke Michael finally defends his belt for the very first time at EFC 112 against the imposing submission machine, J.P. Kruger. And in the co-main event, featherweight champion Iga Smiley Cabessa becomes the next athlete aiming for champ champ status as he battles the imposing Kaleka Block Cabanda. EFC 112 live this Thursday. Watch it on SABC Sport Channel on DTT Channel 4 from 7 p.m. Brought to you by SABC Sport. Time. When you're a kid, it moves slower than a sloth trying to get through airport security. There is just so much of it. Skip forward a few years to your 20s. Time is still your friend. It says have some balance. Go party and have fun. Then your 30s hit. And time suddenly steps on the accelerator like it's trying to catch a traffic light before it goes red. 40s. Now time is moving faster than your 10-year-old on a sugar high. 50. You're desperately trying to save as much as you can, but time is moving so fast. And all you can think is, where did all the time go? That's why after 50 years of investing, we've learned that time is the greatest gift of all. And the good news is, if you invest early, time gives you money. And then money gives you more time for some much-deserved you time. Now... Isn't that a compelling enough reason to invest? Ellen Gray. Long-term investing. Ellen Gray is an authorized FSP. University of Johannesburg and University of the Western Cape have a mammoth task to illustrate what a pitch distinction looks like. This is the Hollywood Bet Super League. Witness the Varsity Derby. UJ Ladies FC versus UWC Ladies FC. The Sunday 14 April at 3 p.m. Live on SABC Sport on DTT Channel 4. Also available on SABC Plus and SABC Sport.com. Hashtag we love it here. Proudly brought to you by SABC Sport. For the love of the game. SAFM. Prime time all day long. 10 after 8. Good morning. Well, on Tuesday, the Electoral Court ruled that former President Jacob Zuma could be a parliamentary candidate from Konto Wissizwe after the Electoral Commission had upheld an objection to his candidacy. The Constitution says you cannot be a member of Parliament if you've been sentenced to a term of 12 months or more in the last five years. Three years ago, the Constitutional Court sentenced Zuma to 15 months in prison. MK had challenged the IEC's decision in court. They won the application. The court has not yet released its reasons in a full judgment. The IEC has said it's waiting for that judgment and will ask for legal advice. However, The case did not just involve the IEC and Zuma and MK. It also involved the person who lodged the objection, who, insofar as I know, has not spoken in public about this until now. The person who lodged the objection against former President Zuma is Dr. Maroba Matsapola, and he's agreed to speak to you. Dr. Matsapola, good morning to you, and thank you for agreeing to speak to us this morning. Good morning, Steve, and good morning to your listeners. Why did you lodge the objection against former President Zuma? Uh, in order for me to answer this question so that people can appreciate uh, the full answer, I have to give you a little background. Uh, Steve, uh, throughout my life as a member of the mass democratic movement, I've generally preferred to avoid the limelight and to work in the trenches in relative obscurity. Uh, consequently, <laughs> People who know me or know about me are the university student activists of the 1970s. And the many brave young men and women who trained with me as guerrillas in exile. And the current comrades who are fiercely prosecuting the National Democratic Revolution as we speak. Members of our society and most of your listeners generally know little about my history as a political activist and about my unwavering commitment to tirelessly and to work tirelessly for for the completion of this first phase of our liberation struggle. 
Well, since I launched my objection opposing former President Zuma's candidature, unforeseen events have changed my relative political inconspicuousness. I mean, uh, the, the recent electoral court hearing and, and the decision on Mr. Zuma's candidature somehow compels me now to, uh, to leave my political cocoon and to defend my own. In that way, I do not let my detractors describe and define me. In my youth, I was a student leader and a fervent black consciousness activist. This was during the, you remember, if you were in the state, these were volatile political uh, periods uh, with, uh, with, uh, with the militant black consciousness movement, uh, <clears throat> which was headed by fearless and bold leadership collective that included the likes of uh, the late Stephen Biko, Professor Bonnie Bikiani, Professor Seth Cooper, the late Deborah Machoba, Dr. Mampela Rampela, Boko James Mafuna, Musua Teralekota, Draco Tomuntumiel. I mean, the list is just endless. As I sit here with you today, Steve, I have slept through and the, the, um, the most unbearable stench of the apartheid James. I've survived the most dehumanizing prisons in foreign lands. I sit here today in this interview as a veteran of our struggle, a former guerrilla who continues to strive to build a more perfect democracy. While I was in exile, Steve, uh, let me just say this. I obtained some university degrees, and in addition to having practiced law as a supervising attorney, I was a faculty member of the National Institute of Trial Advocacy. As you might know, this institution, this institution is, is, is training lawyers from around the globe on trial advocacy. I was also privileged to work as an adjunct professor of law at a prestigious law school in, in Chicago called Loyola University School of Law. Steve, I have no malice in my heart for anyone. I only have the greatest love for my country and its people. Well, let me <laughs> let me uh, 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 answer your question directly now. As you know, the Constitutional Court convicted former President Zuma on charges of criminal contempt, as you have described in your in your in your introduction. This section of forty-seven one e. Uh, it excludes persons who have been convicted of an offense and was sentenced to a prison term of more than 12 months without an option of fine. And, and, and it excludes you from uh, standing for election until five years elapses after the completion, and this is important, after the completion of your sentence. Five years has not elapsed since Mr. Zuma completed his sentence. I read 47.1e, and I believed that, they ex that it excluded Mr. Zuma's candidature. I then exercised my civil duty and responsibility that all of us should have by lodging an objection against his candidature purely, on, or purely to, to, to really ensure that the elections are free and fair. And that was the reason. It is my staunch belief, Steve, that if each and every citizen ensures that the laws of this beautiful country are observed and enforced fairly without fear, prejudice, or favor, the strength of our young democracy will be robustly bolstered. It is my hope that we, we will bequeath to the next generation a forfeited, indestructible, and secure legal democracy. Can I ask, Dr. Matsopola, um, when the IEC went to the electoral court, so, so, so you lodged the objection, the IEC upheld the objection, their decision to uphold the objection was challenged in the electoral court by MK and by former President Zuma. You weren't given a chance to argue, as I understand it. The electoral commission did the arguing. You, you weren't part of that. Have I understood that correctly? No, you, no you, you, you're incorrect, Steve. Uh, I could have. Uh, attended and I participated in the hearing. 
So when, uh, as a man of limited resources, <laughs> I did not participate in the court hearing because I could not afford counsel to represent mm. me. But even if I, I had uh, a brief counsel to represent me, my arguments uh, uh, are incongruent with the IEC's arguments, and therefore my, 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 mm. my, my presence there would have been redundant. However, it is my firm opinion that the IEC should skip the SCA, uh, the, the Supreme Court of Appeal, mm. and seek direct access to the Constitutional Court. I, I, I in appeal this. I ask our and ask our AP course, court to to uh, to review the electoral court decision. I have many many reasons for for this position, Steve. Uh, uh, the most compelling of these reasons is to have legal. It is important that we must have as a country legal clarity on the question of whether the IEC has expressed powers to determine whether a candidate qualifies to stand as a candidate for parliament, or whether the AC has expressed power to enforce to enforce Section 1E and C, uh, I mean 1E, and, 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 and then to, to determine whether the protection afforded individuals in the Bill of Rights shields otherwise disqualified candidates from being removed from the party list by the IEC. The fact that we do not have the actual reasons why the electoral court ruled as it did uh, and limits our, 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 our discussions, you know. Uh, <clears throat> so, so, so you would like the Electoral Commission to appeal to the Constitutional Court? Do you believe there's a strong case? Yes, I think, I think, I think, I think from the arguments and the reactions and the questions that were posed by the by the, the just judges and, and the professors uh, who are now sitting in the bench of, of the electoral court. You know, Steve, the, the, the mass democratic movement founded and established a democracy for South Africans to enjoy certain inalienable rights under the, a dispensation which, which uh, includes the rule of law. Under such a political order, the courts have been entrusted with a duty and responsibility to administer justice. Mm -hmm. As such, the electoral court being one of those courts whose duty it is to administer justice has a rule to dismiss my, my objection and, and the candidacy uh, and, and sustain the candidates of former from President Zuma. I mean, uh, 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 truth be told, regardless of how incomprehensible and senseless you may, you may regard the, the ruling, it is our duty as responsible citizens uh, <clears throat> of this beautiful country to accept the electoral decision. Uh, when I say accept, I don't mean to do nothing, but to, to, to legally. Mm. I, I, I accept the ruling. It is my hope that all those who believed my objection was just and necessary and that it should have been sustained by the electoral court to make peace with the court outcome for now, at least for now. Personally, I look forward to reading the reasoning behind mm. the court's decision. Can I ask, so, so, the, so, so obviously we all need to wait for the judgment, but as I understand it, you, you were named as a party in the case, you didn't argue in the electoral court, um, and, I, and you've explained why. Um, if the electoral commission decides not to appeal, might you decide to appeal yourself? Uh, it will be it will be difficult for me to 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 appeal uh, by myself because um, I I did not participate in the in the hearing. And, and therefore, uh, what will I tell the court that I argued? You see, you have to understand that when you appeal, you tell the appellate court or whatever whatever court sits in the, in the appellate uh, position. You say to the court, here's what I argued. Here's what the, the, the court said. And I think the court is wrong. And I want you to look at my arguments and then decide whether the court is, is wrong or right. However, there are other ways uh, that people can appeal this. 
Uh, for example, the, the people can approach the, 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 the court and ask for a declarator and say to the court, to the constitutional court, constitutional court, there's a very important mm. issue, uh, a legal issue. We want you to declare mm. uh, 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 what is the law. And then we, whatever the, the court will declare, then that will be what we will accept as the law of the land. But I don't have local standing, as, as the legal people would say. I don't have, I wouldn't have local standing, I believe. I might be wrong. Mm. But I don't think I have local standing to approach the, 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 the apex court. All right. I'm, I'm, I'm hoping that the IEC will be responsible enough to understand the enormity of this decision, that this decision will set a very bad precedent. I mean, it will it will open the floodgates of 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 of, 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 of disqualified people to enter and into the fray of elections. Can you imagine? Just imagine if we take the arguments that were presented by uh, Advocate Mbuf that no one is allowed to, to interfere with the rights, the political rights of people that are enshrined in the Bill of Rights. What does that mean? This would mean that, you know, the Bill of Rights shields even disqualified people. Mm. Why would the Constitution mention and, and define people who are disqualified stand for election and then refuse anyone to, to refuse the IEC. And by the way, Steve, you hear, uh, Steve, if, if you read the, 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 the electoral uh, law, it empowers even the chief electoral officer. The, mm. electoral, the chief electoral officer has the power to object. Now, if, if the law empowers the chief electoral officer to object, why would we think that the law forbids him to disqualify or the IC to disqualify the person they have objected against? It makes no sense. But uh, like I say, you know, we, we, we just, uh, 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 you know, almost used a very unchristian phrase, but we're just spinning around. Mm. Uh, until we get the, the decision and we say this is what the electoral court predicated its decision on, that's when we can then engage soundly uh, uh, the, 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 the decision. Mm. Dr. Matsapola, I appreciate you speaking to us, sir. Thank you very much indeed. I know that um, um, when I first made contact with you, you, you said that you are sort of unaccustomed to speaking in public, so I really appreciate the time. Dr. Morobo Matsapola is the individual who lodged the objection with the Electoral Commission against the candidacy of former President uh, Jacob Zuma to stand for MK. As you know, uh, the Electoral Court ruled this week that Zuma can be a candidate for Umkuntu Wissiswe. He is on the candidate list as they've been published as I understand it. However, we have not yet seen, as you heard there, the rulings, the judgment, the full reasons for that ruling. And uh, the Electoral Commission itself has said that it will take legal advice and it anxiously awaits or it's ant- uh, anticipating the release of the reasons for that decision. As you know, it's been a big discussion, a big national discussion. I imagine it will be for quite some time. You were there, SAFM, coming up now to 27 after 8. This is SAFM Sport with Zai Khan. Zai, good morning. Tucks and Sundowns. Yes, it's uh, David versus Goliath Mzanzi style. The University of Pretoria, fondly known as Tux, is preparing for a historic encounter in the NetBank Cup quarterfinal against the powerhouse Mamelodi Sundowns. Coach Tlisane Motaung is rallying his team to replicate their underdog triumphs of 2009, although this time they face the challenge without key players like Promise Mkuma and Tabang Sibonyone, and that's due to loan agreement restrictions. Mataung emphasised the match as a chance for his players to prove themselves against some of the best on the continent, but is well aware of the formidable opposition Sundowns present. I listened to, in fact I was watching the match, uh, I heard him saying that 
but one thing about sundowns, it, no matter how they play, they're able to get results somehow, you know. So one has to obviously be in cognizance of that. Uh, they don't have to be at their best to win matches. Maybe the issue could be we want to score a lot of goals. You Moving on to the story now, there's some relief for the family of Luke Fleurs. Police have nabbed six suspects. Now, Fleurs was shot dead in an alleged hijacking on the 3rd of April. The family of the slain Kaiser Chiefs defender is close to finding justice after the Gauteng police confirmed the arrest of six suspects. It's a developing story and we'll keep you updated here on SAFM. Cricket action, Rashid Khan producing an outstanding all-round performance to lead the Gujarat Titans to a last ball three wicket win over the Rajasthan Royals in their Indian Premier League match at the Sawai Mansingh Stadium in Jaipur yesterday. The home side set a target of 197 after scoring 196 for three in 20 overs. The Titans replied with 199 for seven in 20. Now this is the Titans second victory over the Royals in Jaipur in consecutive seasons. With this win, the Titans broke the Royals' unbeaten run in the tournament. Golf now, Ludwig Eberg only turned professional last June, but the 24-year-old Swede's meteoric rise in the golfing world up to ninth in the rankings means at the Masters tournament he has the tag of dark horse attached to him with many pundits think that he could actually win. This is what he had to say. I'm also, you know, trying to be okay with all those things coming at me at the same time because I think once you start fighting it, once you start trying to push it away, I think that's when it's becomes tricky um, so I guess all I'm trying to do is just embrace all the nerves and all the excitement that I feel um, and at the same time know my capabilities and know my qualities and, and know that you know that's probably going to be good enough to compete. Um. And finally, tennis, Andre Rublev's Monte Carlo Masters title defence ended in the first hurdle with a straight sets defeat by Australian Alexei Poprin. The Russian never got going in the second round. He lost 6-4, 6-4. The world number 46, Poprin, will next face compatriot Alex de Menor, who beat Talon Hrikspur in three sets for a possible quarterfinal against Novak Djokovic. Meanwhile, the number 4 seed Daniel, Daniel Medvedev beat the Frenchman Game on Fees 6-2, 6-4. He'll now face the Russian Karen Katanov. That's in the fourth round. While the Australian Open champion Yannick Sinner, he is through beating the American Sebastian Corder 6-1, 6-2. The Italian will play Jan Leonard Stroff of Germany in the last 16. More sport for you here on SAFM at around half past 12. This is Sunrise Sport. I'm Zai Khan. Zai, thanks very much indeed. In a moment, the future of plastic. That's your mediated conversation. 30. Good morning in the headlines. Parliament's Legal Services Unit has advised the Powers and Privileges Committee that it cannot proceed with its investigation. Our former Speaker Nosivi Wema Pisa Ngakula. Former President Jacob Zuma will today be at the High Court in Johannesburg in the case of his private prosecution bid against President Cyril Ramaphosa. And DA leader John Steenhuisen has urged voters to choose wisely in the May 29th elections. He says voters can either choose to vote for the multi-party charter, which will rescue South Africa, or choose between a MK, ANC and EFF coalition, which will result in a doomsday. I'll have details on these and other stories at 9. SAFM. Guiding you through the rush hour traffic. Lots pending around Pretoria this morning. First up, the Ruth First Road, top end of Shoshengu. There has been a reopen. Low hanging uh, power lines there have been uh, fixed up, so that's uh, good to go there. Uh, but the whole backlog around Thorn Tree Mall still with us. That's the Hebron sort of uh, exits out to Mopponi Highway. A lot of traffic diverted that way during the closure of Ruth First, and it is going to take still some time to recover. No lights on Mopponi Highway at Eskia and Pathali. That's Ebby from Bremer. Uh, going to be asked to queue this morning on the N4 inbound to Hatfield as well as on Solomon. Mishlangu uh, coming from Limwood Road down towards Karsfontein. Two big queues of traffic uh, that you'll sit in this morning. Joburg's uh, highways and byways easing up, the exception being the N3, a crash before uh, Elon's interchange is causing a delay through the cement factory. Uh, Durban looks good. Any earlier problems we had around the Spaghetti Junction have largely been cleared. Uh, Cape Town, a fatal crash just outside Malmesbury on the R45. That's the uh, uh, road that'll take you out towards sort of Hopefield area. So uh, there is a delay there. It's just north of uh, Malmesbury and will 
likely to be a delay for some time. And heading into Cape Town CBD, there's a crash on Nelson Mandela Boulevard from earlier this morning down by Searle Street, and that's causing terrific pressures. Backing the N2 up, coming through from Pinelands, backing the M3 up, coming in from uh, UCT, and it's forcing a lot of traffic to divert down Philip Cosana. So you've got Philip Cosana and Nelson Mandela uh, Boulevard into the city centre area, both under queuing pressure. Rob Byrne, SAFM Traffic. Two years since winning the EFC middleweight title in the most dramatic and controversial fashion, Luke Michael finally defends his belt for the very first time at EFC 112 against the imposing submission machine, J.P. Kruger. And in the co-main event, featherweight champion Iga Smiley Cabessa becomes the next athlete aiming for champ champ status as he battles the imposing Kaleka Block Cabanda. EFC 112 live this Thursday. Watch it on SABC Sport Channel on DTT Channel 4 from 7 p.m. Brought to you by SABC Sport. The boys of Steve Parker resist to leave the pitch without a ticket to the semis. But there's a big problem. Kevin Hunt's boys say the last dance of happiness belongs to them. This is the Netbank Cup quarterfinal battle. Stelis versus Matatanza Pitori on Saturday, 13 April at 2.30 p.m. Live on SABC One and SABC Radio Stations. Also available on SABC Plus and SABCSport.com. Hashtag, we love it here. Proudly brought to you by SABC Sport. For the love of the game. Mediated conversation on SAFM. 26 minutes to 9 now, the time. Good morning. Every day, in every way, you use products that involve and use plastic. If you're sitting down, it's almost certain that plastic is part of the chair you're sitting on. If you're in a car, there'll be plastic in that seat too. When you go shopping, most of the food that you buy is encased in plastic, surrounded by it. Try and imagine life without it. I mean, how difficult would it be to keep food fresh, to keep it safe? Even just to put it in a fridge would actually be quite a difficult experience. But if you go for even a short walk, you'll see plastic lying just about everywhere. It lies around, around plants and rivers and streams, on almost every patch of unused land in our country. And this means we have huge amounts of plastic pollution. And that's before we look at microplastics that get into the bodies of animals and into you. However, there are also newer technology. So right now, you can, buy pl- you can buy plastic bags that will protect your food and then biodegrade in your garden. So then what is the role of plastic now and how will it change? First this morning, the impact of plastic pollution. Rico, you're a Purdue is an expert on the issue of plastic and pollution and a campaign coordinator at the organization Groundworks. Then Groundworks rather. Then Anna B. Pretorius is an executive in technical operations at the organization Plastics SA. And then the future of plastic and maybe what will change and how will we use it and how will that change? Professor Linda Godfrey is the principal scientist at the Center for Science at the Council for Scientific and Industrial Research. We start then with from Groundworks Rico Irpadu. Rico, good morning. Thanks for your time. Hi, good morning to you and your listeners, Stephen. What kind of pollution is plastic causing? Well, you're, that that question is a really good question because it, it directs us to think about where plastics comes from and what makes up plastics. And a lot of people don't think of plastics in this way, but plastics is 99% fossil fuels and about 1% chemical additives that give it all of its properties to make it pliable and to make it hard, etc. And we know that fossil fuels are impactful to the environment and also to human health along the entire life cycle, from extraction, from production to transportation. And we know this because we've witnessed this firsthand. We've witnessed this in the community that we work with on the fence line of oil refineries around the world in South Durban. Um, We've seen uh, health studies in Iraq, in in places like Erbil, where people have high, high levels of of cancer. And we've also seen it documented quite widely along a corridor called Cancer Alley. And this is along the Mississippi River um, in Louisiana between New Orleans um, and Baton Rouge, where where those communities are exposed to almost 200 um, petrochemical plants and, and fossil fuel plants. We also know that the fossil fuel Um, extraction and life cycle is responsible for driving the climate crisis. Um, I think in the Maverick the other day, they reported that this is the 10th consecutive hottest month that has ever been recorded um, on planet Earth ever since um, humans have been taking measurements. 
So we, we, we now experience climate change almost every day. You, you see it in the news. Somewhere around the world, there, there is something that is, is driving the climate crisis. But also, I think, more importantly about plastics is that 1% of chemicals that are used that nobody really thinks about and knows about. And a, a recent study um, that was done by a Norwegian group of scientists, um, they released a study called the State of the Science on Plastic Chemicals. They found that almost 16,000 chemicals are commonly used to make up plastics um, in, in the plastics industry. And the concern is that a lot of these chemicals are, are, are highly hazardous to humans and, and, and the environment. Um, about 25% of those chemicals that are commonly used in plastics. Um, and, and those chemicals make their way into the food packaging that we use, into um, all of the goods that we have. And those chemicals can also leach into the environment. And they haven't really been studied because the industry doesn't disclose which chemicals they use. There's, there's no transparency. And we know that um, some of these chemicals are, are endocrine-disrupting chemicals, and they can affect the reproductive systems of, of fish and amphibians, for example. So that is pretty much why we should be worried about this. Okay. So, Rico, what, from what you're saying, a lot of the pollution, a lot of the impact is stuff we don't see. Exactly. Yes. Okay. Why you talk about how bad it is? Part of it, I mean, and I presumed it was just because it doesn't biodegrade, but that's the stuff we can see. The other problem, of course, is the stuff that we can't see. So we can't even assess how bad it could be. Well, since the advent of plastics in the 1950s, about eight and a half billion metric tons of plastics has been produced. We know that less than 10% of that has ever been recycled or reused. So you are right. There is plastics absolutely everywhere. If we look at the production figures, the global production figures now, it's, it's doubled since, the two, since 2000 until 2019. It's, it's doubled from two. 134 million tons to now just under 500 million tons. So, so the demand of plastics is massive. It's, it's, it's growing exponentially, faster than the demand for cement and steel. And plastic waste is pretty much following this production trend. And if it's unchecked, if we, if we, if we, if we don't, um, if we don't understand what the driver for this is we will never, ever be able to address it as, as a concern. And what we are seeing globally is that the fossil fuel industry is repositioning itself to produce petrochemicals, to produce plastics, agrochemicals, fertilizers, um, pesticides, etc. So, so we need to think about plastic pollution in that way also. Are there any measures to try and reduce the levels of plastic pollution that would work? Is there anything that would work to reduce the impact it's having? Well, we, we are currently in year two of a global negotiation process to develop and, and implement a treaty that is aimed at being legally binding on all states to end plastic pollution. But we, we need to find ways, novel ways, to think about how to regulate plastics and what makes up plastic. So unless we regulate the chemicals that go into plastics and prevent those chemicals that can affect human health and environments. Um, the Guardian in the UK reported a, a study about a month ago where the researchers tested placentas across the world, and every single placenta had a, a plastics chemical um, trace in it. Um, plastics is, is in the air that we breathe. Um, we, we hear that in some cases around the world, People are breathing in about a credit card's worth of microplastics as, as plastic dust every week. Now, that can't be good for us. Plastics in placentas can't be good for the developing fetus. Hmm. Um, anyway, any which way you, you look at it. So we have, to, we have to have global measures. They have to be globally, legally binding. And they have to think of plastics along the entire life cycle. And it has to address plastic production. It has to eliminate and address single-use plastics or plastics that are non-essential. It has to address microplastics. 
and it has to address chemicals of concern in plastics. Rico Iripadup, thank you very much indeed. Campaign coordinator at the organisation Groundworks. 18 minutes to nine. Continue your mediated conversation today about plastic and the future of plastic. Annabee Pretorius is the executive and technical operations at Plastics SA. Annabee, good morning. Good morning, Stephen. We use plastic because it's so useful. Is there still such a strong demand for plastic? Uh, I, do you agree with uh, Rico's comment that the demand for plastic is still increasing dramatically? Um, as an industry, sorry, as an industry body, we would have loved if it, if it increased dramatically. But for the last six, seven, eight years uh, in South Africa, we hover um, around 26 kilograms per capita. In other words, we haven't seen any increase, um, dramatic increase in plastic consumption in, in South Africa. It follows world population. It follows local population. So the growth in plastic demand follows um, population growth because, as you mentioned in your introduction, we, we really use plastics every day to make our lives safer, more convenient, easier to, to help with food safety and everything else. So, no, we haven't seen dramatic increases beyond beyond population growth. I realize you represent the industry and your organization is called Plastics SA, but you say you would prefer there to be a higher demand for plastic. I mean, from what we heard from Rico Irupadu, uh, plastic doesn't make our lives safer. I mean, I realize it does in the short term, but it is surely having a big impact on us. No, I, I think these, um, you know, we, we, um, we're known for, for different from some of the, the scientists and, and findings that they do, because these obviously quite a bit of susceptibility there. Uh, but if you just look at a motor car, and um, I just looked at the, then this morning at, at car accidents, for example, how many drivers climb out of their vehicles um, totally protected by the plastic shell around them, um, where the car is totally written off. So, um, yes, safety is, is a, a relative concept. Um, the industry, uh, and I hear comments around the, the chemicals we use, the industry is, is on a risk base. In other words, when polymer producers and plastic companies use chemicals, um, they have a positive safe list from which they select chemicals. And, and those percentages and quantities are so small that, that you really need to want to say you need to eat the plastic products um, around you and keep it in your body. And, and we know petrochemicals and, and plastic specifically is inert. It doesn't actually react with your body. It, 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 um, it leaves with your urine and, and everything else. Now, plastic, plastic is still making our lives safer in general. Okay, so you're not worried when you heard the previous guest suggest that microplastics are found in placentas? No, I'm, I'm, yeah. We, we also need to acknowledge the fact that many of these um, science and a lot of the microplastics that trace um, worldwide now is based on tiny, minute fibers, which are coming out of the textile industry, and there's also quite a lot of rubber crumb around. So plastics gets the flag, but the plastics, the textiles, the rubber industry are, are all the, the products we find in the environment and in the human uh, tissue um, has actually split amongst the textile industry, the rubber industry and the plastic industry. I'm not, I'm not concerned uh, about the findings, no. Okay. The cost of plastic, I mean, we use it because it's cheap. Is it going to stay as cheap as it is? It, it's always interesting when people say it's cheap. Kilo for kilo, plastics is not cheap. In actual fact, your paper, your steel, your glass, Kilo for kilo is actually a cheaper material. But plastics is saving money, and, and that is what we need to take into account. In other words, why is a brand owner selecting a plastic pack versus any of the alternative materials? And that's because it's so light. So it saves on transport, it saves on energy, it saves on, on the logistic cost, um, and therefore it's perceived as being cheap. But kilo for kilo, it's definitely not a cheap material. 
Is the science behind plastic changing? The way in which it's produced? Um, the kind of plastics that are being produced? I mean, I, I used the example earlier um, of, of a plastic product that literally allows you to store food and then actually biodegrades over a month or two in your garden. Are the products that are coming in that are made out of plastic changing? They, we, we definitely see an increase in, in compostable and, and biodegradable plastics. Um, as an industry in, in South Africa, recycling is, is definitely uh, better than, than the figures quoted by your previous speaker. We sit around about 23-24% of every product that's made in South Africa gets recycled back into a product. Now, you cannot do that with compostable and biodegradable materials. Um, if you look, for example, at our carrier bags, now I know it's awful in, in the environment. It's really a, a terrible product and, and littered everywhere. But currently, our legislation in South Africa says that every carrier bag must contain at least 50% recycled content. That means previous carrier bags that gets collected and, and turned into new bags. Now, if we grow the compostable and the biodegradable aspect, um, we have less material to recycle because you can't distinguish between these bags. If they come on a conveyor at the plastics recycler, it, you cannot distinguish between a compostable and a, and a, a normal petrochemical-based material. So it definitely is um, providing much difficulty and it, it's a threat to the local recycling industry. Anna B. Pretorius, thank you, Executive and Technical Operations for Plastics SA. In a moment, the future of plastic. We'll speak to the Principal Scientist at the CSIR, Professor Linda Godfrey. It's 11 minutes now to 9. SAFM, guiding you through the rush hour traffic. Good morning, Jeffrey. First up, an earlier crash on the N3 coming out from uh, Germiston and uh, Alberton areas at the uh, Hilton Ace Interchange. It's just a little bit slow rather than uh, heavy. In fact, there are two crashings, one near Cement Factory and one up at uh, Hilton Ace. Also on the bike, one, a collision going north before 11th Avenue in the Houghton area, so that's heavy from Parktown and a bit of a backlog arriving from Melrose, Houghton Estate going south into that scene as well. Uh, route 1 out of Pretoria, easing up down to the roadworks at the R21. A little bit of traffic then again between Old Joburg Road and the Oliphant's Fontaine exit and the R21 queuing both ways as lane closures approaching Oliphant's Fontaine and the sinkhole closures going towards Pretoria after Oliphant's Fontaine so some queues uh, both ways there uh, Durban has eased up nicely, no major problems just a warning, uh, sort of off peak part of the day recently has been quite heavy uh, from Umgenero down towards Spaghetti Junction they can often flick another lane restriction in, in the off peak part of the day so just a heads up if you're driving south in towards Spaghetti Junction today and you find some queues it won't be unusual and then Cape Town, uh, very heavy pressure getting into town through Hospital Bend, a crash on Nelson Mandela Boulevard at Searle Street. That's heavy from the bend. And the alternative, Philip Cusana, a lot of traffic on that route this morning to avoid Nelson Mandela Boulevard and instead just dragging uh, some delays into town very slowly on Philip Cusana. See two routes inbound from Hospital Bend. Stay heavily backed up. Rob Byrne, SAFM Traffic. The Spanish princess tells the riveting story of Catherine of Aragon, a woman who has an eye on the English throne and nothing and no one is going to stand in her way. It's a vivid and captivating reclaiming of Catherine's story, which has historically been overshadowed by her infamous marriage to King Henry VIII. Tune in to drama, plots, romance, the twists and turns. Stay for the suspense. Channel your inner royalty with The Spanish Princess. Start Saturday the 6th of April at 9.30pm, only on S3. Sundowns ladies believe they belong at the top and they want the vital three points. But Linda Lani ladies are on a mission to shock Banyana Bas style. This is the Hollywood Bet Super League. Witness the queens of the beautiful game. Mami Lodi Sundowns ladies FC versus Linda Lani ladies FC. The Sunday 14 April at 11 a.m. Live on SABC Sport on DTT Channel 4. Also available on SABC Plus and SABC Sport.com. Hashtag we love it here. Proudly brought to you by SABC Sport. Mediated Conversation on SAFM. Eight minutes to nine. Continuing your mediated conversation this morning around plastic and the future of plastic. Dr. Uh, Professor Linda Godfrey is the Principal Scientist at the CSIR. Professor Godfrey, good morning. Thanks for your time this morning. Good morning, Rika, Anabi, and to your listeners. 
You talk about uh, at the CSIR creating a circular plastics economy. Uh, what is that? <laughs> no, really great question. I think we're hearing a lot more about this concept of a circular economy. And I think if the conversation that we've had leading up to this point highlights anything, is that a discussion around plastic can be incredibly emotive. You have, you have groups that say, well, you know, there's a human health issue, there's an environmental issue, we need to ban plastic. And clearly for, you know, protection of the environment, protection of human health. And then the flip side is we have a group that says, well, you know, this is a waste management problem. The fact that we see plastic lying in the environment is because we, we're failing to, to collect waste, we're failing to perhaps recycle that plastic waste as much as we would like to. And we get stuck in this pool between these two to say, well, which is it? And I think it leaves consumers and it leaves the public very confused in terms of, well, what can I do? Well, you know, am I having this impact on climate change? Am I causing microplastic pollution? Is there a risk to my own human health? And I think as scientists, our role in this is to provide the evidence. And I think the evidence is overwhelmingly clear now that it's not either one of those solutions on its own. There is no single solution to dealing with the plastic pollution problem. Yes, plastic plays a very important role in our life. We've heard it from Anabi in terms of you know, mobility, transport, in healthcare, in, in the food uh, and protection of food that we eat. So it does play an important role. But the evidence shows that, in fact, we need a suite of interventions across the entire value chain. There are certain products on the market that don't need to be on the market in plastic or don't need to be on the market at all. And so let's have a discussion around the elimination of problematic plastics, for example. So there are some. Go on. So there are some products where maybe we can substitute it with something else. Maybe it makes sense for it to be in paper or in glass or in metal. So there are those upstream interventions to say, well, how do we start, start to slow and turn off the tap of what's actually coming into the market? Again, absolutely, there's a discussion of saying we have to improve waste management and collection and we have to improve recycling. So we've got to be focusing on all four of these areas to make sure that we, we harness this opportunity that plastic does provide to our lives. So, for example, I mean, if we take, I don't know, a boring example, tomatoes, nobody likes them. Um, but if you've got tomatoes, do they really have to be sold in plastic that does not decompose? Or are they biodegradable plastics that we could use to sell tomatoes? To, to, well, to, to sell tomatoes in. And I don't know how many punnets of tomatoes are sold in South Africa every day, but it must be millions. I mean, I mean the volume of plastic just in selling tomatoes must be huge. Yes, well, you know, again, there's been a lot of discussion around the importance of plastic and the longevity and shelf life of food products that we're putting uh, into our supermarkets, for example. And again, this is why the science is so important. Tools like life cycle analysis and life cycle sustainability analysis that gives us the evidence of saying, does it make sense to put these tomatoes in a plastic bag? And that starts to then raise this whole issue around food waste. And, and Rico was talking about the climate impacts of the production of plastic. We know the climate impacts of food wastage. And, and again, you know, the evidence shows us that we're wasting around about a third of all food that we produce before it even reaches our table and the climate impact associated with that. So where it makes sense to put a product in plastic to ensure the longevity and to reduce the food wastage, again, let's make sure we're using the science to make sure it's wrapped in the right thing. Now, this question around biodegradable also starts to become very confusing because you mentioned, well, it can biodegrade in your garden. Not all biodegradable plastics will degrade in the compost heap in your back garden. Some of them require industrial composting facilities with high temperatures, the right moisture content, etc. There are products, though, where it makes absolute sense for us to be having a discussion around biodegradable. And I say those are products that by their very nature are destined for, for application or disposal to land. So think about agricultural plastics, for example, the mulches that farmers use on their land to protect crops. Let's make those biodegradable, where basically you could kill them into the soil and they biodegrade in situ, and you don't end up with microplastics in your soil. Mm. Things like um, absorbent hygienic products, your diapers, sanitary products, where 
They, they designed for disposal to a landfill site or into a pit latrine. Again, it makes sense for them to be biodegradable. So let's use the science to inform. And, and my fear is that because there's so much interest now around plastic, we're seeing a lot of greenwashing. And there's a risk that retailers will play on this. And again, let's use the science. Let's make informed decisions around how we are appropriately using plastic and I think the last point I want to make is, is that, you know, I remember a conversation uh, with colleagues from the UN who said it almost doesn't matter what the product is made from. It matters how many times we use it. Hmm. And I think this speaks to this issue around single use. And, you know, Anabi spoke about the car. That's long-term application of plastic. Rico spoke about it in our food products, single use uh, use of plastic. And it, again, it comes back to single use consumption. We as consumers are at the heart of this. And I think so many of the environmental challenges that we face nowadays are related to this issue of increasing consumerism, mm -hmm. increasing single use because of the convenience that it provides to our daily lives. We have a huge amount of plastic in our country, but actually around the world, in parts of Asia, I understand it's worse. Uh, famously, um, there's a huge amount of plastic in a, pla in a particular place in the Pacific. People call it the Plastic Sea. Um, I mean, is that still going to be a... I mean, are my grandchildren going to have oceans of plastic around the world that we'll never be able to get rid of? I think, unfortunately, my personal opinion, yes. Uh, you know, the, the rates of plastic that we see leaking down of rivers in West Africa, in Southeast Asia, for example, uh, with ocean currents, it's, it tends to start to accumulate in certain places. There's a lot of work being done to see how we can actually try and recover plastic from our oceans. But again, the easiest solution, turn off the tap, stop it from coming down our rivers. Uh, Ultimately, that plastic over time will start to degrade. It will break down into smaller and smaller. Unlike biodegradable, it will actually just break down into smaller and smaller pieces, into microplastics that um, will either you know, fall down to the bottom of the ocean, um, it will be taken up in sediments, or will be taken up, uh, you know, I think Rico spoke about uh, finding it in, in fish. We see it in, in marine animals. We see it in bird life, for example. And I, I think this is the challenge around microplastics is, um, you know, they just break down into smaller and smaller pieces that uh, will linger in the environment. Professor Linda Godfrey, thank you very much indeed. Principal scientist at the CSIR. My thanks also to Anna B. Pretorius, Executive and Technical Operations at Plastics SA. And starting us off today, Rico Europe Adieu, the Graham Campaign Coordinator at Groundworks. Really appreciate the time this morning. That will be available for, uh, for you as a podcast, also available already as a podcast. Thank you, Stanza. That conversation we had with Dr. Marobo Matsapola, the person who lodged the objection against former President Jacob Zuma's candidacy, he says that he would like the electoral commission to appeal. I thought that was a significant interview, if I can use that word. Uh, we will see you tomorrow. I nearly forgot, by the way, uh, Eid Mubarak, if you're celebrating. I hope you get to spend time uh, with your family. I hope you get to uh, spend time with your community and just to enjoy the celebrations. From Mdu, Stanza, Zelma, Melissa, myself, look after yourself. You're with SAFM. Kathy is next, leading the conversation. It's nine o'clock. In our top stories, Parliamentary Committee lacks authority to investigate Mapisa Ngakula and Pretoria schoolgirl uh, school murder suspect back in court. Good morning. Parliament's Legal Services Unit has advised the Powers and Privileges Committee 